All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, to our uh, workshop, agenda, uh, workshop meeting of June 27th. Um, we will do a roll call. We have Molly, Justice, Dan, and Chris, our city administrator, uh, present. And we have uh, Mayor Lee Kiriakou, um, Paloma, and Ren online as well. I am also here. I'll be sitting in. Uh, for the mayor this evening in person, although he's uh, out there on Zoom. Um, and Nick, our attorney, will also be uh, coming via Zoom as well. Um, we have a pretty long agenda tonight, so we'll get started. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the water meter upgrades presentation by CORE and Maine with Ed Balicki, uh, as well our water and sewer superintendent. Good evening, everyone. Uh, a few weeks ago, I brought to you uh, modifications to our meter water meter law to for an uh, increase in penalty. Um, part of that penalty, the reason for that penalty is we wanted to move forward with upgrading our water meter infrastructure. Um, tonight, we brought Corn Main, who is our water meter distributor, um, to do a presentation to go over the the the, the points uh, and the, the background of the upgrade and, and what the really the, the purpose of it is and what the, what the upgrade is going to bring to the city. Um, so we have representatives, uh, we have Michael Johnson, Rob Bruce from Corin, Maine, and Sense, from Census, who is the meter manufacturer. We have Jason Burkhart um, to answer questions as well. So I'd like to hand over to Mike Johnson and he'll move forward with the presentation. And, and just a, a bit of context and a, a correction from last week. This has already been approved in our capital program from several years ago. Um, we, we, we wanted to do this presentation so that you're feeling, you feel comfortable when we bring forward a, a contract in the near future. Um, someone had asked me last week if all of the meters are being replaced, and I thought that most of the meters were, and I was incorrect. It's just the... Um, the part of the meter for reading, the MXU unit, will be replaced. So the physical meter, meters will not be replaced, except for the old ones that didn't get done the last time around. So, that's, so I apologize for that. Right, um, that's basically like the black thing that's put on the exterior of your building. I don't know if it's still black, but uh, so it, yeah, oh, here we go. So we, we have all, a show and, show and show well, tell this you evening. you got it right in the last meeting. <laughs> Yes, I was. Uh, I brought show and tell just uh, for the council and for the uh, residents, people watching. So this is your typical water meter um, that's located inside your house. This one is a uh, five eight, so it's a little smaller. Most of the ones you see now in the homes are three quarter. It's just a little bigger. So this is what's recording your the passage of water into your house. This this component here is called the MXU, which is connected to the meter by a wire. Um, is usually mounted externally or internally in the house and this component here is what's going to be ch is the major component that's changed as part of the upgrade along with going from more of a fixed based software it's more of a cloud computing um, so it's this this physical piece of hardware and then the upgrades to our the software so we're going to have a presentation by michael johnson of corin maine <clears throat> All set. Thank you. Good evening. Um, Mike Johnson with Corin Maine. I'm the product sales specialist. Uh, Corin Maine is a distributor for pipes, valves, fittings, as well as meters and reading systems. I've been working with the city of Beacon here for many years, um, going about about eight years. And the nice thing here is because you're already a census customer. Um, it's a fairly simple upgrade. Um, there will be a key component um, that we have to change out in the field for this, but I'll get into that a little bit more. I probably should have just let Ed do this because he is very prepared, it seems like, but uh, I'll, I'll jump in and just talk about why we meter and what you're currently doing and what the next step is for you. So I get a lot of questions about why we should meter, and it's, it's pretty simple, right? There's, uh, there's a real cost associated with providing clean, safe drinking water. You have staff that is monitoring and keeping up with the infrastructure on the ground, meaning your pipes, your valves, your fittings. Um, and then you have staff that's going to be uh, monitoring and keeping up at your water uh, treatment plant. 
Um, after that water is, is used out at the, you know, the end, the end user or by the end user, it's then got to get treated again and go through the wastewater treatment process uh, before it gets uh, distributed out into the waterways. So we want to make sure everybody is paying their fair share and we want to be able to, to monitor what's being produced and, and then compare that to what is actually being used. And by doing that, we can re, uh, conserve resources, we can reduce costs, and we can hold um, everybody accountable, like I mentioned, and reduce our non-revenue water. Um, non-revenue water is water that's being used that you're not actually accounting for. And that could be inaccurate meters, it could be theft, and it could be a leaking distribution system. So the way you currently do this, um, the way you currently monitor, is you have what's called a drive-by system. This drive-by system is often referred to in the meter world as automated meter reading. And you have a technician that goes out and with a laptop in their vehicle, reads each individual water meter by driving around through the city. Uh, so each one of those water meters communicates to the MXU or that radio transmitter. And then it sends a signal back to the laptop in the vehicle. This process takes place every three months. It's on a quarterly basis. So when you go out and you do that process, you might be finding alarms or leaks or issues that could have been going on for the last three months, right? So it puts you in kind of this reactive state um, and it's a little bit time consuming. It takes your technician about four days from start to finish. And then it leaves you with typically I'd say 100 to 150 um, of devices that have issues that that technician needs to go follow up with, find out what those problems are in the field, solve those problems, and try to get bills out to your residents. Again, it's, it can be frustrating for your folks, and it can be very costly and time consuming. The next step uh, to eliminate some of those problems is to go to AMI, uh, which is Advanced Metering Infrastructure or Fixed Base, right? So all of those meters and radios that are out in the system are actually gonna start communicating to antennas that are located at your water tanks. And there are gonna be two locations. Those antennas are gonna con uh, connect up to a data collector, and then it's gonna send all of that information back to a uh, piece of software that's monitored from wherever you have internet connection, right? So you can monitor it from here at City Hall, you can monitor it from at home if you have employees working from home, um, and then your guys in the field or girls in the field can utilize that software out there too to help them troubleshoot and, and solve those problems. So this is very efficient. Um, it takes the reading process out of out of the equation, right? So instead of going out reading to find issues, you're gonna have all of that information at your fingertips and you're gonna be able to resolve those problems pretty much immediately. Um, you can automate reports so that every Monday morning, your technician or your folks in the office receive the appropriate reports and it shows them what needs to get taken care of. So it shifts you from being reactive to being proactive um, and then it also provides better customer service to your residents. So they can call in to City Hall and they can ask, hey, you know, I got my water bill and I'm, ha I'm having a, a bit of a problem understanding uh, why my bill is so high. You can pull up hourly consumption and you can track and you can see what might be happen happening. Maybe they have a leaking toilet. Uh, maybe they filled a pool on a specific date, but you can have all that, that information in front of you at that time. So Ed mentioned earlier that um, the nice thing is, right, you already have most of the meters in place that you need. There's roughly 300 meters that need to be replaced. And we're recommending that this is done with the new solid state uh, water meter that doesn't have any moving parts. Uh, it'll allow smart meter technology. It'll allow better accuracy. Um, and it will uh, ultimately give you a 20 year new meter accuracy warranty. The other portion of it is going to be replacing about 4,500 
of those MXUs or radio transmitters. Um, some of what you have out in the system are compatible with this new system. Um, like I said, most of the meters are compatible with this new system. So you're going to be able to utilize that existing investment in that infrastructure and, and continue moving forward. Oh, we're also going to be adding in acoustic leak monitoring on your main line or your distribution water lines. Uh, this will help you tighten up your system and discover leaks um, just on the water, uh, the water lines in, you know, underneath the streets. So this is the dashboard in which the uh, billing clerk will have access to or the city will have access to. So that includes the technicians out in the field. Uh, you can easily navigate through different applications to look up specific accounts, um, look up specific reports. You can automate those reports and you can also just see the general health of your metering system. And then you can also look at specific alarms that, that might be present. This is a quick look at what the alarms dashboard looks like. So you can log in and you can see this specific customer has it set up with these three widgets, right? And uh, right here we have uh, all alarms in the last seven days. Right, so, and it lists them all out and you can drill down into that data. So you can see what meters aren't communicating, um, what, uh, what leaks that might be present in the system, uh, theft that might be happening, such as empty pipe alarms. And then they also have a widget on the dashboard there that shows you all empty pipe alarms in the last 24 hours. So in this specific case, there are three alarms for empty pipe within the last 24 hours. You also have uh, continuous flow over the last 24 hours, and there's 25 alarms for that. So you can, you can click into that, you can drill down into that data, you can notify those customers that might be seeing, um, that you might be seeing those uh, alarms on, uh, and you can let them know so that they can resolve the issue and avoid a high bill. With this upgrade, we're actually gonna include the customer portal. The customer portal will allow your residents full control to monitor their own water consumption. So you're gonna give them the power to make the appropriate decisions that, that best fit them. When they log in, they can see that their, their current consumption and they can compare that to uh, their previous consumption last bill billing period. You can also look at that same billing period, but for the year prior, and see if you're on track or if you're using more. Gives them the ability to monitor alerts that might be on their account. So if they have a continuous water flow, such as a leaking toilet, it will be flagged there. It also gives them the ability to set up their own alerts, such as if they were gonna go on vacation. They can put in a date range, and then they can get notified if there's any consumption on that service line. If they go to say Florida for the, for the winter, they can set up a notification. If you wanted to notify your residents of any issues or say boil water advisory or uh, like city hall is gonna be closed for a holiday, you can send out a notification through this this program as well. If you have a customer that has, um, maybe, maybe they're, they're a landlord, right? And they have multiple properties that they wanna monitor. They can have multiple properties under a single sign-on, under a single account. Or if you have someone who takes care of elderly parents, you can add them as a recipient so that they can monitor for leaks and they can monitor their water consumption and ensure that they're not going over a certain amount, help control their water bill. So how do we get this done, right? Core in Maine uh, is not just a distributor, but we're also can be, we can also be that general contractor where we offer you a turnkey solution. We come in, we provide the materials, we install the meter and the MXU out in the field, and then we install the radio infrastructure that goes along with it. We'll provide full project management for this throughout the entire course of this project, where we'll have 
monthly meetings or progress meetings with the city to ensure that everything is on track. We're gonna give you access to real-time information. So as those installs are taking place, you'll be able to see how many there are, who is going out to do those. We'll have all that information, like the, the technician that's performing that. We'll have before and after photos of that installation. And we'll also uh, work with the city and communicate back to the manufacturer to ensure all of the information that come in, that's coming in is accurate. That's what you want to see is configured properly. And we make sure everything goes smoothly. So I think the benefits are pretty clear, but I'll just go over everything real quick. Um, in summary, it's going to provide you um, the ability to better utilize your staff and increase the efficiency of your staff by having all of that information at their fingertips instead of finding it out in the field and then having the rush to go out and, and solve those problems before bills occur. Um, it's going to be able to, it's going to give you the ability to reduce the cost to maintain and monitor your infrastructure as a whole. So uh, I talked about acoustic leak monitoring. There's also other devices that can be tied in like tank level monitors and um, uh, turbidity monitors and so on. You're going to have increased customer service because you're going to have the ability to look up individual accounts and provide the information to that resident. And you're also going to have the customer portal as an option as well. You're going to improve the safety and well being of your staff. So, currently, your technician is out there driving around with a laptop in their vehicle trying to navigate the dangers of the road. You're no longer going to have that. You're gonna reduce non-revenue water by deploying this system because you're gonna have all of that information in near real time. Um, the, the hourly reads that come in are gonna give you the ability to track and find trends to solve those leaking toilets and things. And then you're also gonna have your permalogs to determine your leaks on your main line. And you're gonna accurately bill for water. So if you don't get a reading currently, you end up estimating. Right, so you're going to accurately bill those for what they're using, and when you do that, you're accurate. You're accurately billing for sewer as well because sewer is based off water consumption, and overall, it should improve your cash flow. So I'll hand it back to you, and uh, if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. So the, <clears throat> this comes at no cost to the uh, the homeowner. Is that, is that correct? So I'm not sure how you're going to distribute the cost, but. Um, so th this is being paid for as a capital program I item. It will be paid for out of the fees over the long term, but there will be no additional cost uh, to the users for this installation. But, but they do pay for it over the long term. Right. And if there's a new build that that's part of a new build cost would be they would have to install whatever our latest water meters yes. are, as I assume they do now. Yes, yeah, so if there's a, a, as these new apartments come on, they'll have to pay for meters like they do now. And they'll have the new MXU unit with it. That's the only case where you have to pay for it um, is, is when, un, unless you've damaged it personally, like you, I don't know, your plumber did something that made it inoperable. On page five, you described, or you mentioned uh, the antenna um, where all the data is transmitted to. Can you describe that antenna and where it needs to be placed? Sure, yeah, absolutely. So at the top of the water tank, uh, we're gonna mount, it's uh, about 10 feet tall. It's a uh, omni antenna. Um, a coax will then run down the side of the tank and the data collector will be mounted next to the side of the tank. Uh, which water tower? So the, this would be at Fairview and Howland, right? Okay. Got it. Okay. So we have four water towers and these are the ones furthest up on the mountain. Okay. I think I got that right. Okay. Ed, Ed is trying to teach me all this stuff. <laughs> What is the process of communicating with the homeowners in terms of actually getting into it, accessing their houses, and how long would that take? It's a great question. Um, so my install contractor will provide letters. We typically do three mailings, and then we do door knockers, right? And we'll do that based on, uh, based on districts, water districts. So if you've 
if you just build a specific water district, then we'll send uh, notices out to that to that area. Um, and again, we do three notifications. And, and we only have, you know, we're not a district, we're the city, so they all go out at the same time, but we would have to break down the city probably by ward or quarter or route, uh, yeah, to okay. implement this in a methodical way. Um, and, sorry, will the uh, letters for people who aren't paying attention, will they just uh, say core and main on them or will they say city of Beacon because if somebody who's not paying attention and doesn't know who you guys are sees like, oh, core and main, this is probably just an ad, might just throw it away without even opening it. <laughs> so it will be on uh, city of Beacon letterhead typically yeah. and it will have the install contractors name on there and their logo and all of our install contractors will have uh, name badges as well as they go out and do not door knockers so it, we're gonna we're gonna really heavily rely on the city to help us move that through that process right because we will get individuals that just don't respond so we'll have it up on our website we'll do, we'll push it out through social media we'll do a 911 call to initially tell people this is coming and then kind of what we did with main street so that everybody's aware that this is coming um, and to expect it the one question i've heard is um for people that work during the week that might not be home to access this will there be saturday hours or weekend hours or night hours in which they can arrange to have somebody come in so we're we're fairly flexible on that we'll tend to to take a list of those individuals or start making a list as we're doing those calls right and um when we get a, a good amount Put together right we'll we'll choose whether it's going to be a weekend or an evening install or something along those lines so right. we'll we'll do our best to accommodate them and how how specific do you think you'll get in terms of windows of time that you will show up at a specific house like, would it be like Verizon that says we'll be there between 11 and 6 o'clock at night or something um, uh i can't re I, I don't remember the time frame typically I th it might be it might be three hour time frame window mm -hmm. Um, and they usually send out a notification prior to actually arriving. So they'll get, they'll receive a, a text message or an email that the technician is on the way, and it will also include a picture of that technician. And, and this is, I mean, the success of this is based on accessibility in part, and yeah. we have 300 or so meters that we actually need to change. And this is why we changed the law recently in terms of encouraging through penalties people that don't cooperate um, yes you have us, people that never upgraded their meter on right. the last one and we have people that have had estimated readings for many years right. and we just can't get access so we're hoping between a combination of the recently changed law and you know uh, communication on the part of of your company that everyone will get on board with this yeah if everybody responds um you know in a timely fashion it should be fairly smooth um that's really the key thing is is making sure that you have some type of method to push individuals along to to make that appointment right these uh dashboards on pages eight and nine these are customer dashboards i think you said so that's um that would be from a municipality side but okay. um, that is a live, a live system, a current customer. That so customers can have their usage on their phone. They can download an app and, and check their usage. So that would be on the slide that shows the customer portal. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit different. It will show the alerts for their specific accounts, um, and it will show notifications for their specific accounts, and that's it. So they won't be able to see their usage. They can see their usage. They can see their current consumption and they can also drill down and it gives them hourly information as well. Okay, that's great. And part of that also, if we have a drought um, advisory and we need people to stop reducing water, we can push that out through this as well. We could put a notification through yep. that. Yeah. yeah. And then just a stretch goal. Um, if we want people to reduce their water consumption during a drought, we probably have an idea of how much we need to reduce that by. I wonder if we can give people targets so that they could see on their phone, I'm going over the drought target or I need to reduce by 10%. It would be an interesting feature to give people a goal to hit um, to yep. reduce their water consumption. So it's interesting that you brought that up because if you do have an idea of what you want people to reduce their water by, if they have the portal, the end user has the ability to go in and add a custom alert 
So if they don't want, if they want to get an alert, if they hit a hundred gallons of usage for the day, they can set that up, mm -hmm. right? Maybe they typically use 150 and they're trying to, to trim it back. They can set up an alert so that they're notified when they hit a hundred gallons mm -hmm. or whatever it might be. Okay. Thank you. And, and George, if I could, I just want to clarify, we didn't pass the law yet on the water meters. We did the public hearing on June 21st, and we would bring that for a vote on June 5th, on July 5th at the next meeting. So we, we still do need to adopt that law. Right. You, you said something about having access, I believe, like, say, a, you have a parent who has a house or something, and someone yeah. else could be able to monitor. Yeah, so you can set up an account under the individual property owner's um, name. So when they set up an account, it has to go under the person that has their name on the bill, uh, but then you can add additional recipients and that's pretty much unlimited. So if you wanna add um, you know, your children, you can do that. If you wanna add your neighbor, you can do that. But only the, the person on the bill can allow that. So, I mean, Correct. I can't be accessing my neighbor's Right, meter correct. Usage without his, uh, uh, you know, participation or <laughs> cooperation. Um, I'm curious about what cost it would be like. This might be a, the actual number. I'm not interested now, but just the idea of having some other languages in the letter that goes out. We do have some Spanish language primary speakers in some of our units, and just make sure that they're aware of it. I don't know how large a need is, but I think that could be beneficial to get some of those cases where people might not be responding because English is not their primary communication language. You know, I've never had that request and I really like that. Um, that's a really great idea. I don't see a problem with adding maybe a second uh, second slip in there that's just translated into to Spanish. Yeah, I'd be curious to know as you talk about it, just what what options might might be there. So. Yeah, we'll explore that. I mean, we might even just put something, you know, that says in Spanish, if you want Spanish, right? Translation. Please, yeah, contact please this go number. to this website yeah. or call. Yes. Yeah. You know. Well, if yeah. it's a letter, you could have an English letter on one side and a Spanish letter. Yeah, on if the we other can side, get it to one page, speaking people don't have to do extra work. Yeah. Okay. Um, are the. The people who are physically here are monopolizing the conversation. <laughs> I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Do we get any green energy credits for this, or do any states provide that that you know of? Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the answer to that. <laughs> I'm not aware do of any. Do you talk about smart meters as as green energy, as environmentally, uh, having an environmental impact? Absolutely, yeah. I think it's a super important um, process to, to incorporate in any municipality, any water district, um, because it gives you the ability to really tighten up your system and, and reduce your, your non-revenue water. It also reduces pumping costs if you tighten up your system, and it also reduces the cost to monitor and as well as treat. So every every bit of water that you waste or that goes through your distribution line and leaks out into the ground, you're, you're providing chemicals for that water, right? So if you can tighten that up, you're going to reduce your cost there too. So it's definitely a environmentally friendly process and, and super important in terms of conserving resources. I have one last question, but it might, it might be one for Ed. Um, so I know we installed acoustic monitoring throughout the city a few years ago. Um, and one of the things that um, that's mentioned on slide six is that there's acoustic leak devices. Um, how are these acoustic leak devices different from those we already have installed? Sure. So um, Ed. You don't currently have acoustic leak detection installed, right? It was a process. What, what you referenced, Dan, was <clears throat> prior to my employment here with the city. Um, the city did look. The city did install acoustic leak detection. There was these nodes that were placed throughout the city. the The biggest issue with that is there's a there's what's called a correlator. So this node picks up noise, and then you would try to go get another node, put it. And then they communicate to each other, and then they, you try to narrow it down. We didn't have 
the city at the time didn't have that correlator. So it could say that there was, and it could say that there was a leak, but you wouldn't be able to find it. And it was that system that we had was similar to how we're reading meters now, or it was a drive by. You actually had to drive by it, where in this case, the leak detection that they're supplying to us communicates through the same network that the water meters communicate through. So that what we had, uh, it, was, it was defunct. I've been eight years now. It was defunct well before I started with the city. Mm -hmm. So, okay. And some of these other ideas with the you know tracking the the volume of water in the in the tanks and that kind of thing we we already have that in some form now yeah yes we do through our SCADA system that uh, for those of you that that I think everybody almost has toward the facility yeah we have that but then there is other things um, more you could tie it in if you had a citywide SCADA system um, some of the, some communities use it for lighting control mm -hmm. so they MXU the, the water meters talk to the lighting turn lightings on turn lightings off they can you can track not how many hours are on compared to the daylight it's it, there's that much functionality to them where you can expand in if just something that we're not thinking of yet it still has the ability to expand to that if we if we if you can if we can push to it mm -hmm. thanks so much and just, just real quick I, it was one of the questions earlier there was a couple of questions the di i live in a dutchess county water and water authority district and we, my district went through this um, it was very seam very seamless. We we received the notices in the mail that this was coming. We received the notices that if you didn't respond, there was a penalty associated with it. We made our appointment, and most of the appointments, like on my street, the technician did multiple houses. So like yes, there was a window like twelve to three, but he did my house, my neighbor's house, down the line he went. It would it would like ten fifteen minutes each property, and he moved on. So it was very 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 seamless. Great. And is anyone else? I have a question for you, Chris. So this has a 20-year warranty, and I'm just wondering from a budgeting point of view, do we keep track of, as a city, like, oh, things that we might need to replace or future capital costs that might come up with things like this as we know about warranties? Yeah, I mean, we, we assume a uh, useful life for every asset that we invest in. Mm -hmm. So like, um, when we bond things like this, we work with our bond council and the manufacturer to understand what the useful life is. So this would actually be bonded over 20 years. Okay. And then typically the department head would keep track of, okay, we're, we're getting towards the end of this useful life. Um, we should be looking at replacement or upgrade at that point. Okay. And then some things, um, you know, again, as we can, we we do try to extend the life of certain assets. You have parts of your wastewater system that were extended for 30 or 40 years. Um, now, again, that at, at some point you get to a break even where you're paying a lot for repairs. So I, we, we would aim to have this in a capital program. We don't go out 20 years, but but certainly it would be on our bond schedule. And as, and as that 20 year window comes, like, can only imagine what the technology would would be right when when the drive-by system came out like we were most people didn't have a cell phone in their pocket or the, or maybe they did but the, what they're capable of doing now it, it, it was, wasn't even a thought back then so technology who knows what it will be in 20 years when it comes to how it's communicating or what functionalities are there i think Paloma might be trying to no okay Anybody else? Uh, anyone out there in Zoom world? No? No, I think everybody else asked all of my questions. So thank you for being thorough. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank um, you. Let's hope everyone cooperates. Thanks, yeah, thanks very yes. much. Have a good evening. All right. Thank you. All right, the next item on the agenda is accessory dwelling units, a local law. We have John Clark, our city planner, uh, Nick Ward-Willis, our attorney online, and Chris will be helping out with this. I think, I think the mayor was going to lead off on this, and this is a continuation of the conversation that we've had over about a year period on accessory dwelling units. Um, okay. um, I, I'm actually going to uh, want to see the material that John and Nick put together. There's a lot of good stuff there. Um, you know, I read through that. Um, the only thing I just want to point out before I hand it off to John 
is that, and you can see this on the zoning map, uh, of our residential properties in Beacon, which is the vast majority of our land, something like, looks to me like about 90% of the land is in single family zoning. And it looks like about 80% of the uh, lots that are residential lots are single family. So as you can kind of see that we use up a huge amount of our land doing it, the only um, allowance for any additional um, unit in that entire section of the city is the accessory dwelling unit, which we, as you know, enacted more than 30 years ago. I think John told us we had a total of 29 of them on those, you know, couple of thousand uh, lots, which obviously is a very small number. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. I know, John, you've got some more stuff. I think the most interesting statistic is that our average household size in Beacon has declined um, <clears throat> almost by about one person. And in some respects, this is just um, kind of repopulating uh, our biggest use of land in the city. I don't think we're doing dramatically uh, significant changes. I think we're just simplifying and enabling. I think we'll have a very, very modest impact but that's my two cents. And John, why don't you just start up? I appreciate the material that you and Nick have put together. If you're there, John. Hey, yeah. John, I think you're on mute. Uh, I shouldn't be. Can you there hear me you now? go. Yes. Okay, and you can see my screen? Yep. So um, I was asked to do two things at the last workshop, one was to put together a presentation that sort of showed how uh, configurations on a lot would look like. And the other was to summarize what other communities are around. I put the, first, uh, the second one in a memo. You should all have that. Uh, if you have any questions, we can go over that. Uh, but for the slide presentation, I wanted to start off by reiterating that point about population and, and housing and um, population per household in particular. Uh, if you look at the top chart, um, since 1950, our population has been relatively steady. It's certainly been almost exactly steady since 2000, according to the preliminary numbers uh, of the 220 census. Um, and yet our population per household has gone down 12.5% since 2000. So even though our number of housing units has gone up by 12% since 2000, the number of population in each one of those households has gone almost even an equal amount. And so you get a sort of net gain of population is steady. And we can see all that also that uh, effect on the school enrollment chart. Um, school enrollment's gone down 28% since 2004 or five. Um, so there's fewer kids, there's fewer persons per household and there's more elderly people who are in single family homes and either need to move out or to find some revenue source. Um, to fill up those empty bedrooms or empty backyards. Um, this is the map that the mayor was talking about, illustrates in yellow are all the R1 districts. So combined, they make up a large percentage, an overwhelming percentage of land in the, in the city. And in those districts, you're only allowed to have single family homes in terms of residential uses. Um, so, uh, you're allowed to have accessory apartments. We're hoping to sort of liberalize that a little bit so that uh, they become uh, more of an uh, effective option to uh, not only repopulate those districts, but also to provide some level of alternative housing. So this is an R10 um, typical lot, 100 by 100, 10,000 square feet. Uh, you can see the, the basic parameters down here. Uh, you're allowed to have 25% maximum building coverage. Here you have a 2,000 square foot house and a 500 square foot garage uh, and a little shed in the back. That gives you 16% coverage. So you're well below the 25%. You can also see the configuration of setback lines. This is where the house has to be. I assume you can see my cursor, right? Um. Yes. Yes. Okay. And these lines are where accessory buildings can be, a secondary set of lines. So the garage can be up to this corner. The house has to be in this one. And you can see how setbacks determine architecture in some senses, because historically houses have been sort of 
perpendicular to the road because the house lots tend to be narrow. Now, uh, with the setbacks and the configurations, um, it's more of a, per a parallel to the street configuration where the house, so you tend to get more ranch houses, you tend to get more uh, houses without porches uh, because porches, any covering on a, a roof porch counts as towards that setback. So it pushes the house back even farther to have a, and you can see that the buildable envelope in that, in that lot is actually pretty small. It's only 75, 25% uh, of that lot. Mm -hmm. And so um, it makes for a sort of a uniform look going down the street. Um, and not a lot of variety because of the constraints of the setback lines. Um, so if you took this 10,000 square foot lot and you wanted to put an accessory apartment, the likeliest thing to do is convert the garage, either put a, um, a floor above the garage or convert the floor above the garage for a 500 square foot accessory apartment or put a two level uh, accessory apartment in where the living quarters are on the ground floor and the bedroom is on the upper floor. And it shows that you can fit three parking spaces, which is what's required, um, barely. So if your lot isn't perfectly configured, your house, you're, it's hard to fit those three parking spaces on because they can't be in front of the building. So that would require a variance. And if you even go back to the original without the accessory apartment, this typical lot with a typical size garage, two car garage, and not even a big garage, doesn't meet your standards because you have to have 40% maximum for each accessory building. So you got a thousand square foot and that's based on the footprint of the principal building. So a thousand square foot house, you can only have um, a 40, 400 square foot accessory building. So even this sort of more typical thing that I assume is a not uncommon state where you have a 2000 square foot house and a 500 two car garage, that's illegal under your curtain zoning law because this is so constrictive. And then if you go to an accessory apartment, then you run up another standard. Um, you're still violating the 40% rule, but you also can only have 960 square feet in this district for all accessory buildings. So if you put a thousand square foot accessory building, accessory apartment here, that violates that. And then you have to have two variances in order to get that typical without including any additional coverage, how you would typically assume that you would put an accessory apartment on that property, um, you're in violation of the code and you have to go get a variance. And our experience is, is you get the variances, but it just adds another couple months to the process and another application fee and all that sort of um, extra work. I'm sorry, can you just, I don't mean to interrupt, but can you just explain one more time the for, what the 40% is? So under the code uh, for accessory buildings, uh, you can only have for each accessory building 40% maximum based on the footprint of the principal building. So a typical house, thousand square foot footprint, you can have a 400 square foot um, outbuilding. That's the largest outbuilding. That's not big enough for a typical two car garage. Most garages are like 500 to 550. Uh, in order to have room to maneuver around your car. So um, even in a typical two-car garage, you're in violation of the code the way it's currently set up. Okay, and so it does it, oh, I'm sorry, I just a point of clarification, does it only count as a thousand square foot if it's a 2,000 square foot two-story? No. It's okay, yeah, because 500, sorry, 500 square feet is only 25% of it's the footprint. It's the footprint. Okay. Yeah. So square footage would include both the first and second and uh, and other floors. The the footprint is literally the width gotcha. times the length of of what it places on the parcel. Thank yeah. you. So if you have a smaller house, which a lot of houses in Beaker are smaller than two thousand square feet, if you have a fifteen hundred square foot house or a twelve hundred square foot house, that outbuilding becomes even smaller as forty percent of the footprint. So to me, those the, the constrictions in the code don't make a lot of sense. Um, so let's try the R15 or 5,000 square foot minimum lot size. So here's a typical 5,000 square foot lot, 50 by 100 feet deep, and a one-car garage on it, and the same 2,000 square foot house. 
and I'm being generous there because a lot of the R1 um, five houses are much smaller than that. You actually meet all the conditions of the code. Um, but if you want to convert that garage to an accessory apartment and put a 700 square foot accessory apartment, um, now you're in violation of both those um, columns in the accessory building table. You have more than 720 square feet of, for all accessory buildings. You have 700 plus 100 here. And you're well over the 40% max for each accessory building. So this is, the, this is what happens when you go up against the code and you're trying to sort of fit in an accessory apartment somewhere on your property. And, and these are typical sorts of lots. You know, there's, there's, um, there's houses that are much smaller, for instance, that make these almost impossible to meet. So if you look at the accessory dwelling units over the last six years, since I've been around, so I had records of them, we've had nine applications, all of which have been approved so far, but over half of them had to have variances for the, the latest one was this one for the total square feet of all accessory buildings. Um, this one, they wanted to convert a barn that was already on the property, was within so many feet of the rear line. So they had to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals for a rear yard variance because they were improving something that was too close to the line. Um, this was the same thing. They were improving the garage, which, which was less than 10 feet from the side property line. Um, this one was the most bizarre one, actually. They had a garage. They wanted to tear down the garage and put an accessory building in, but it was too large for the 40% rule. Um, so they got around it um, by attaching the new building by a, a covered breezeway to the house, because then technically it was attached to the house and could be a little bigger. It didn't violate the accessory building law. So you can see the sort of contortions that homeowners have to go through in order to make these things fit with the strange standards, with the multiple standards that you have to meet. Um, you can also see how the rules make a difference in how long it takes to, to get approved. Uh, the first three were under the special permit by the city council. And in 2020, they changed that to it was special permit by the planning board. So I cut the time in half just by changing those two words in the, uh, in the zoning law. Instead of seven or eight or 10 months to get a, an apartment through, now it takes somewhere between two and, and uh, six months. Here's a real life example. that her, uh, This is the last one that was approved uh, just before the planning board. It's an existing house in the R1 five districts, so 5,000 square feet houses. This was a little deeper than 100 feet, so I think it was 6,500 square feet in this, in this parcel. Uh, they had a three-car garage. So in order to put these uh, new building in green here, they had to take off one of the bays of the garage. Um, and then they put in a relatively small accessory apartment, or they're going to. They got the approval for it, only 448 square feet. So that's close to the minimum allowed. Um, um, but they still ran up against um, the 720 square feet max for all accessory buildings. So they had to take another couple months to go to the plan to the zoning board of appeals, get their variance, and come back. So these are the sort of things that we were hoping to avoid um, to take out some of the arcane um, rules in the accessory dwelling law that was written back in the. Um, 1989 and the accessory building table, which I'm not sure when that was written. So here's the three zoning um, tables that we want to provide minor changes to. So first of all, uh, under the use table, the accessory apartment would be allowed as a permitted use, as opposed to a specially permitted use. So uh, in these three districts, the R1, the uh, RD, and the a transitional district. We're not changing where they're allowed in the in the city, but they're allowed as of right, so that if you meet the standards, you can get the approval. A special permit 
Uh, there's extra hoops you have to go through in terms of an application process and um, general standards that you have to meet that can be challenged and it's a reason to say no. Um, so they would be allowed as of right if you met the standards. In the area in bulk table, um, what I'm suggesting is that we reduce the front yard setback in all the R1 districts by five, five feet, is it? I can't read that, it's so small, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, and what we found is that the building envelopes are very tight, as you saw in that R10 example. And just by giving that extra five or 10 feet out front, it allows people to put front porches on their houses. It allows people to put perpendicular uh, houses as opposed to ranch houses. And so therefore they get more space, green space in their lot that's usable, that sort of thing. And um, there is a provision in the code that allows the planning board to adjust the front setback to make it uh, consistent with houses on that side of the street. And that's used all the time because historically the houses were set much closer than the zoning allows now. So we have to go through this, ask the applicant, they have to do a study of all the depths of the houses within 250 feet on each side and justify that they can move the house forward to where it's historically appropriate. Uh, this just allows them uh, that, that option to be uh, less onerous. And then the other changes is here in the maximum percent building coverage. For some reason, and I can't explain exactly why, in the R5 district and the transitional districts, there's no building coverage. So that means you could build, in theory, a McMansion there that would take up the whole building envelope. So every other district has a maximum building coverage so that you, you maintain a certain percentage of green space. For those two districts, it was left out. Historically, it's been that way for years. Um, and what I'm recommending is 40% on those small lots. So 60% would still be um, open space and 40% could be building cumulative, the house, the garage, the outbuilding, the accessory buildings, whatever. And I'm doing that for a simple reason that um, the third table, this accessory building table, uh, these two lines, these two columns here are the ones that cause a lot of trouble. The maximum cumulative square footage for all accessory buildings, um, which runs in the variances quite often. And what I'm suggesting is you don't need that column at all. You, if you have building coverages, it, it tells people what simply without a bunch of calculations and variabilities and, and uh, sort of unjustifiable numbers. How do you come up with 720 feet here, 960 there? It's arbitrary numbers. Whereas the 40% is equal across the board um, in those districts. It's a progression that makes sense in terms of the um, larger scale lots getting uh, larger setbacks and larger coverages. Um, so yeah, I don't think you need this. What, what I'm suggesting is you simplify it. So there's one number you have to meet for accessory buildings, well two, because I'm leaving this column in, but I'm changing it to from 40 to 50%. And uh, instead of based on the footprint, it's based on the total square footage of the house. So the primary building, you can't, you know, it makes sense. Why should you be penalized for having a one story house or penalized for having a two story house? And that, and that usually went against our older homes that are more compact and then go up as opposed to single story ranches. I don't think I, I have a, sorry, John, if I just have a question on this point, sure. um, I'm looking at slide three and trying to interpret, um, looking at slide three through this, uh, this, the changes you made to this chart. So we have a two story, 2000 square foot home we can account for the entire square footage of the home now to calculate the size of the ADU. Right, right now we have a 500 square foot garage slash ADU that's 100 square feet above over what's permissible under the current law. Now you would actually be able to double the size of that garage. So you would go from 400 square feet to 1000 square feet. Is that correct? Uh, yes. That's a significant change. That's a, that's a big change. Yeah, but it's no bigger um, than the existing building. I mean, it could be a one-story larger piece, but it, you still have the coverage 
um, I'm putting in a coverage factor so that um, now in, I'm putting it in the R500, yeah. but there's still a 30% co building coverage for or 25% building coverage for this. So there's already a, a stop point in which you can only build on mm -hmm. um, on 25% of that lot. Thanks. And our height limits in R1 are just two stories, right? Two stories, yes, 35 feet. So, and that would apply to the ADUs as well. Yes, and I would actually suggest, and other other um, communities have done this, is you put a lower height limit on the accessory buildings, so that they don't they're always considered um, secondary to the main house. Most or a lot, some uh, ADU laws have 25 feet as opposed to 35 feet, for instance, for the secondary buildings. And so that that way, the garage or the ADU building, a two story building back here would never look like a second house. It would always look secondary to the main house. So that's something you could consider. Thank you. So those are the the changes that are suggested. Uh, now, there are other changes in the text of the law. Uh, that makes it there's more flexibility in the size of the units. Um, there's um, um, a consideration of a parking waiver. There's other things that we've gone over in the previous workshop when we went over the law itself. Um, but the, the point of these is to provide a, an option in the R1 districts for some level of affordable housing or small scale incremental housing that won't overwhelm neighborhoods, won't make drastic changes to the character of the neighborhood, but will provide homeowners more flexibility about using their property to their advantage, considering the size of, of families these days and the elderly population and all the other things that are going on demographically. John, uh, to the best of your knowledge, has do you know of any applications for ADUs over the last six or however long you're aware of, been denied by um, planning or zoning? No, they've all, these are the only ones that have been approved. I mean, um, applied for, as I remember. I and can't remember any that were like withdrawn or something. They always manage to make changes, but it's a, it's a torturous process the way it is now. So, um, I, so anyone who wanted it ultimately got it over the last six to 10 yeah. years. Yeah, if you remember the planning board memo, the planning board was very much in favor of this as a housing option. And so they work with the applicant to make it work. Uh, but some, like I said, the, the one on Herbert Street went through some pretty serious con contortions uh, from their original plan in order to, and they still needed a variance. Um, so it's, it's um, the law is as it is, is not set up to encourage these. Um, they're set up to put up roadblocks. And it, it's very expensive too, because um, when somebody comes in, they're paying the time for our attorney at $275 an hour to be there for land use issues. They're also then paying John's time to review these. And in circumstances where the engineer is involved, because there's some nexus with city infrastructure, they're, they're then paying his time as well. Um, so if you're on multiple months, it, it adds up into the thousands just for a simple apartment. And I know I, there was one of these that came through. I have, to, I have to sign vouchers that allow checks to be produced for all of the payments. And when I see these come through, it, it kills me how much they cost. It's in the thousands of dollars just to get a simple application through. And think of the fairness of it, because to build to go in on a vacant lot or even um, an existing lot, you have the ability to tear down the house or put up a new house that's 3,000 square feet next to your neighbors um, without anything more than a building permit. No planning board review, no um, special permit, <clears throat> no public hearing. And yet somebody to put a small addition in their backyard or to even put a accessory unit inside the building that will nobody will know it's there other than there might be an additional car there. They have to go through a special permit process. They have to have public hearings. They have to have abide by all these arcane rules and go for variances. And um, 
it, to me, it, it's it's a fairness issue. And um, as I said in my memo, historically, single family zoning and these sorts of rules have been used to discriminate against people, pure and simple. The history is clear on that. Uh, discriminate against rent renters, discriminate against poor people. Um, and I, it just seems like um, the, the playing field ought to be level. If you allow single family homes to go through with just administrative approval, um, I'm not sure why that you need to go through all these hoops for a small addition to that single family home. Uh, right now, the single family home could put up a 2000 square foot addition as long as they meet the coverage requirements um, and not come to the planning board. And yet for something that's 800 square feet or 400 square feet, um, there's all this disincentives. Yeah, thanks, John. The, uh, I think this makes uh, a lot of sense. Um, the other thing that uh, um, I saw the, the city of Kingston had uh, a version of this and they're suggesting to um, simplify it. It kind of goes in the same direction. I saw some material on Westchester that also is going in the same direction. And again, we're not we're not making it. You know, we're not going to open floodgates. Um, but I do think that uh, making it a little bit easier is a good thing. I I'm not sure of all of the nine that you've got on this page, but I I do know the last two because um, I spoke to both of the um, homeowners, and the last two were for mothers, right? So for our mother-in-law, I guess depending on which uh, spouse you're talking to. So, um, you know, and I, I think that's very reasonable what we should be doing. Other questions, comments? Um, I, I think as I listen to the conversation, not necessarily this time, but in previous times, I think because we're using the correct planning terminologies, if these are permissible, these are as of right, I think some people are concerned that that means people can just build whatever, which is not the case. And so not tonight, but I'm wondering if some other meeting we can talk about what of the process we've changed. We talked about the high fees, the kind of having to go before the planning board, maybe even the zoning board of appeals to get variances. So in the proposal that we're considering, what are the requirements and checks that people would still have to go through? Because I think that sometimes is missed in the, in the conversation. I think that might be helpful for the people who at least some of the comments and concerns I'm hearing, people think that they're kind of allowed to do whatever. And so if I think we talk about the checks that would still happen, that might be useful. Why doesn't John field that tonight? Uh, that, yeah, if there's he, time he and capacity He clearly knows tonight. that. <laughs> yeah, sure. John, if you can, if you were able to speak to that tonight, that would be great. Yeah, under, the, under the draft law, it still would go to the planning board. Uh, there still would be a public hearing unless it was inside the house and involved no addition to the house. So if you wanted to convert your back two bedrooms to a unit and have a shared stairway or an exterior stairway in the back, um, and there was no addition required to the house, it could be approved by the building inspector. But if it involved any addition to the house or any uh, um, new building in the backyard, it would go to the planning board, it would still have a public hearing. That would also apply to converting an existing garage? Yes. Yes. Right, and, and as you said, it would have size limits, uh, maximum footprint limits, and setback limits still, right? Yes, it still have to comply with setback limits. No, we're not changing those except for the front setback just to make more room on the lot for configurations. Um, but the side and the rear yacht line would still be the same. Um, we're maintaining the... the um, the, the percent of, of the size of the unit compared to the size of the house. And we're retaining, and in fact, we're enhancing the overall building coverage requirement so that it can't be overbuilt uh, on the site. So there will be always more open space on the property than building space, even in the smallest district. One, one of the things I wanted to highlight is that when we went from the change where it required a special permit from the city council to just planning board, I'm sure people were concerned at that time that it's going to open the floodgate. All of a sudden, we're going to have this whole, 
you know, everybody's going to be putting one of these in and it's going to change neighborhoods. And based on what happened after that, the only result that we really see is that it diminished the amount of time to go through the approval mm -hmm. process. Yeah. Well, I, I was, it was one of the first votes I made on council. And I remember that, um, Lee, George, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that was when we were redoing all of the area tables and the use tables mm -hmm. um, a couple of years ago. So I think I'm, actually we didn't hear much about it. Um, just because it was wrapped up into a, a whole it. charts and charts of, of uh, you know, red text. So yeah, it is interesting. They um, the study after uh, they they completely um, liberalized the laws out in California for ADOs on a statewide basis. So now communities can't discriminate against ADUs. And what they found was something like twelve percent of them after the, the approvals were used for home offices. And 21% were used for either living accommodations or some other use by the single family homeowner. And I think that was because of the pandemic. A lot of people all of a sudden needed an office space. Um, so, but 50% of them are about were used for rentals and then something like 16% um, were used for a friend or family and 19% were used for a family with no rent. So a substantial of them are used for family oriented or friends at low rents and 50% are used for market rents or something close to market rents. But what also they have found is that people tend to rent them for smaller amounts, not only because of the, um, the things I listed in my memo about no land cost and uh, smaller development, pro no developer profits and all those sorts of things. But it's also because psychologically, if you have somebody living on your property, you tend to either want to know that person or you want to feel comfortable with that person. And so you tend not to push them on the rent because you, if you have a good tenant, you want to keep them. And they found when they interviewed homeowners and renters who were involved in ADUs over time, they found that they, they um, a lot of times um, put in lower rent because they got to know the renter. They didn't feel like they wanted to push them on the highest possible rent. And on the renter side, because you have less privacy, because you always have a homeowner sort of looking over you, um, you might want to be willing to pay as much for that, where you would have total autonomy if you rented someplace else um, and with an absentee landlord somewhere. So there is, is some psychological things about having the homeowner live on the site that also make the rents um, what they call naturally occurring affordable housing. So without any requirements, they tend to be less, less expensive. John, I have a scenario that uh, was a, a developer I know who uh, is looking to flip a house in Beacon and it's a typical Beacon lot and has a garage in the back. And he was asking about ADUs and I assume he wanted to turn the garage into an ADU and it'd be uh, flipped. How is that done and what kind of review does that go can a developer do that if they're not living there? No. So it can only be the homeowner that actually does it? I mean, These have to be owner occupied, don't they, John? Yes. Now, so the, if he doesn't, I mean, if he lived there and did it and then wanted to flip it two years down the line or half a year down the line, he could do that. But whoever moved into that property would have to live on the, either the small unit or the large unit. Or they so lose the it because otherwise it's a two family. Right. Right. So that would follow the deed, any kind of, you know, say, say, you know, anyone, a homeowner turned their garage into an ADU and then they sold five years later or something like that. There would be a deed restriction on that. It would be clearly defined that that is not a two family residence, but that it's an ADU. Yeah, so it's not a deed yeah. restriction, but rather it's in the it's certificate of occupancy and it'd be in the building department records. Okay. And have we ever, uh, is anyone aware of any complaints associated with ADUs, the existing ones? I the haven't, I haven't had any in the year and a half I've been here. Mm -hmm. And so in your packet is the proposed local law that you uh, addressed previously that would impose some tax changes to section uh, 223-24.1. You would also be making changes to your table of uh, scheduled dimensional regulations for accessory apartments 
scheduled use regulations for accessory apartments, and then also regulations for accessory buildings on residential lots. And I believe you've workshopped these before with respect to the, the uh, specific text. So the next step then would be, if you wanted to proceed, is to introduce the local law and refer to the planning board in the county and schedule a public hearing. What are people thinking? Wait, sir, what are, what are, what are we sending to the county? It would be the proposal in the agenda packet. You'll see there's beneath um, John's letter in our memo, there's the proposed local law that you previously workshop plus three attachments to the local law. The schedule of uses and the schedule of um, dimensional regulations that would need to be changed to allow the um, implement the changes that you've discussed. So you would be sending to both the city planning board and the county planning board for report and recommendation, those local law components for them to comment on. You could also at the same time schedule the hearing, or you can wait till you get receive those comments back and then schedule the hearing. Um, so under general municipal law for changes in zoning, we have to refer it to the county. Right. And the county will often say, you know, there's no impact on the county. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes they'll say, well, we think you should tweak, tweak X, Y, and Z. And similarly with the city city planning board, we would want, they're the ones that deal with this on a on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. So we would want their input into yeah. the chain, particularly the, the details. Mm -hmm. We didn't do that last fall. We did, and we had positive feedback wow. from both planning boards. Okay, but, and, but as again, I remember what happened is that the uh, the draft was updated to reflect the planning board's comments. So I'm not, I don't know if it's changed. I guess it would have to go back to the planning boards because it has changed, even if it's in favor of what they originally suggested. But and I don't believe we had comments from the county. I think it was a no impact a matter of local. Yeah, they usually right. say it's a city matter or yeah. something like that. Right. Um, so, Nick, you you were broken up a little bit. Are you proposing we do that tonight? Like, no, this should be on for your next workshop. Oh, okay. I oh, mean, yeah, sorry, your next voting meeting on your agenda. So, you, you if if you wanted to move forward, you could set a public hearing on July fifth for the next meeting, which is July nineteenth. Okay. So, I, I I personally would like to uh, spend some time going over. I actually want to do some. I want to draw. <laughs> I want to try and do some different scenarios of what lots will look like with the, new, with the old and the new. Um, I can say right now that I, I'm in favor of density, and 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 some of this uh, is very good. I think the R15 and the R17.5 are still. It's going to be a little cluttered, and as much as we'd like to wish that people don't drive cars, everybody has cars. I don't know how many people. Last I had checked, it was a very small number of people who live in Beacon actually work in Beacon. So if you want, if you work, you have to drive somewhere. Um, so I'm worried about having, you know, a 2,000 square foot, a 1,000 square foot, and then enough on-site parking to fit to fit all that. Um, that gets that gets really dense. Uh, the amount of green space starts to disappear. We're taking away a little bit of front yard. So I I think on the whole, this is the right direction. But I think. I think we should reflect on R15 and R17.5 and see how that's going to see how tight that's going to get. Cuz we're for density, but we don't want to like smack people over the head with density. Yep, the um I, let me make a suggestion. There's a lot of material here and not everyone kind of saw it the last time around cuz we've got some new members. So um what I would suggest is why don't we send this version on to our planning board? and kind of get some input. That'll give us a little bit of time. And, and we should, in fact, ask them, what do you think about these for R15 and R175 and get their opinion? Because they, they probably have a better sense than we will. And I think that'll give us a little time to kind of think through uh, some of the things that you're uh, worried about, Dan, in terms of the smaller lots. Does that make sense? Yeah, as long as they're just giving, they're just looking at these dimensions and not all the rest of the stuff that we haven't discussed yet. Um, well, they well, would look at the whole law, okay. and we could so, ask them to, you know, that concern was raised about the smaller lots, the R5 and mm -hmm. 75, and we asked them to specifically speak to that. Okay. Nick, when you, when you and Jennifer refer this over, can you do that? Yes, we'll include a cover memo that um, puts it in context for them, so they have specific direction. And then why don't we wait until we get a response? Um, and. Because if we're looking for their input, we should kind of hear what it is. 
Um, is that all right? Um, I'd like to add one more, uh, uh, overall fine with this plan, I'd like to add one more sort of thing that I'm interested in hearing from the planning board about, um, which is around um, the parking language. Um, it's pretty vague um, saying that the planning board and its discretion can waive all parking requirements. Um, and I'm curious if it would be appropriate um, and helpful to them for us to give a little more direction around that. Um, I've been hearing particular concern um, both in terms of you know different zoning areas, but um, many of Beacon streets are very narrow as we all know, including our main street. Um, and I would be more interested in seeing um, those variances um, not given in narrow streets um, than streets that are quite wide, for example. Okay, so we've got a third item we're going to ask them about the the R15 and R175 and then also kind of just parking thoughts. Yep, that's subparagraph F of the proposed local law. So we'll direct them to that language. Okay. Okay. Everyone good with that? So um again, we're not uh moving to schedule a public hearing yet. We're going to kind of collect some more input and then go from there. Uh, although I think what I'm hearing is generally this is right direction, a couple of questions, right? And uh, on some of the, you know, uh, smaller lots and on the parking side, okay? So as you're not introducing the local law or scheduling a hearing, we can just send it to them informally as part of just ask to place it on their agenda along with the- Nick, we're losing your audio. Sorry. Chris, hopefully you can hear me. Yep. Yes. Good. So I'm suggesting that seeing that you're not introducing the local law or scheduling the hearing, it doesn't require a formal council resolution. We have the consensus of the council. We can just work with staff and have it placed on their agenda to provide you with review comments and we'll include that cover memo addressing the three topics discussed at tonight's meeting. And the planning board's next meeting will be July 12th. So that that's a good time to put it on if they can take it on the agenda. Great. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, for the next two items, Nick is going to uh, give background on that. And then we have some guests this evening who are going to uh, walk you through it and be here to answer questions. Okay. So Nick, can you just give a, a quick overview of what we're doing with the next, and then we can have REA come up and uh, give his presentation. Yes, thank you. So you have before you a proposal for the development of a vacant lot in the hip lofts development off of uh, Front Street. And it's a 3.5 acre property. And this parcel is located in the Fishco Creek Development District, the FCD district. And that's found at section 223-24.11 of your uh, city zoning code. The Fishco Creek Development District is a little unusual from other districts in that it requires concept plan approval from the city council before the planning board would grant site plan approval. So this is just development on one lot, but it requires um, concept plan approval. And that was done in 2017 by amending the law so that the city council would have some review and input into the overall concept. And I want to take a moment here and just distinguish. It's not site plan review. That's left to the planning board. The planning board determines where the trees go, the number of parking spaces, it's really a much broader role for the city council that you may recall. Um, actually, this council has not had a, a project before. It. The last council did, and George and Dan and Lee may recall that. It was um, some clear distinctions. Some of it is blurred. And the code gives you some guidance in this uh, when it talks about the process. Um, it does require that concept plan approval be obtained first and that the matter be referred to the planning board before the city council would vote on the concept plan. And you're really just looking at the general con uh, configuration and layout. But there are a few key things that you need to, to look for. And you are holding a public hearing on the concept plan. Section uh, G is about site development plan approval. And what you need to be concerned about is the development design standards in paragraph I that talk about um, generally how the building should be um, is architectural features and guidelines and how the buildings fit into the fiscal pre-development and specifically in um, subparagraph 10 
public access for Greenway Trail as part of the Fishkill Creek uh, District is to allow for Greenway Trails and, and access. And in part of reviewing the concept plan, the developer would be required to go through and establish to the council's satisfaction how they satisfy that concept plan approval. And you would also receive input from the um, city planning board. So before you tonight is Ariane Siegel, who has a concept plan that we're going to present to you. Right now, you just have the concept plan, the layout, some building architecture. We don't have the underlying um, site development application or the environmental assessment form, and that will be provided. The next step would be for you to determine, has the concept plan been fully fleshed out that you wish to refer it to the planning board for uh, review and comment? Or do you want to come back and give them some comments tonight so they can then come back to you at a subsequent meeting and give you a further refined um, project? George, that's an overview of the process. Thanks, Nick. Uh, now we have Arie Siegel, the architect of record for this project. I'm just going to get the mouse from Ben. And if you can move your mic, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Ben. Okay, next slide. Uh, good evening, I'm Arie Siegel, um, representing the applicant. So the, the property, as you can see on the uh, aerial view over there, it's a vacant lot adjacent to the Beacon Lofts project. Um, it's off of Fishkill Avenue near the recycling center. And as Nick was saying, we're, we're here this evening because the project is in the FCD zone and the first review is here with the council uh, for the concept plan before we go to the planning board. So um, I think you can see the, that that's the area we're talking about. And that's a site plan. So you can see the building um, in relation to the landscape improvements. We also have the um, Greenway Trail going through there. There's the trail along the bottom is existing, and um, we would be improving how that works. Uh, you know, once the property is developed. <clears throat> And those are the floor plans for the building and just some, some views of the uh, building massing that will be developed further with the planning board. So the applicant is proposing to build a uh, two-story mixed-use building that fits the primary goal of the FCD zone. <coughs> Sorry. And that's to encourage the development of undeveloped or underutilized industrial properties along the Fishkill Creek in a manner that provides a mix of residential and non-residential uses. And um, <clears throat> that, that's exactly what we're doing with this project. The entire first floor is a commercial artist studio space. The second floor has 28 loft apartments and 10% of those will be below market rate rentals. The building's about 58% commercial, um, which far exceeds the minimum requirement of 25%. So we, we, we fit all the um, specific FCD zoning requirements. We're not looking for any variances. Uh, we have all the parking we need um, for the two uses, the residential and the commercial. We would be working with the architecture review committee on the building design because it's a, um, it's, in addition to the design standards, it's also in a historic district over there. So we, we would have to satisfy both of those. Um, but the basic idea is that the design kind of recalls uh, the nearby factory buildings along the creek and also the adjacent developed uh, Beacon Lofts property. Um, and, and again, you know, we'd, we'd go through that design process with the architectural review board as we go through the planning board process. So basically, um, that, that's just a quick summary of the project, um, and then we look forward to your review of the concept plan and your referral to the planning board when it's time to do that. 
<clears throat> Thanks, Ari. I have a, a couple. Are we allowed? Are we ready to do questions? Yeah. Sure. Um, so um, what I'm really interested in is um, what I'm really concerned about is construction in and around the creek um, mm -hmm. and what the impact on the creek will be. Um, so if you could speak to that generally, but uh, two questions that I have. Um, one is how do the um, how do the conditions after construction um, how closely do they heen to the pre uh, um, the, 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 the sorry the pre existing I don't want to use pre existing mm. conditions but you know what I mean what it was like <laughs> before the construction um, and uh, it was particularly with regards to the flow of water mm. and uh, my second question is um, is this greenway trail going up here between this building and the beacon lofts is that like a spur of the greenway trail why is it why why does the greenway trail go through parking lots oh yeah that that maybe I should just do that one first. But basically, that all, all of that Greenway Trail that you see there, um, and, and then it hooks over to the right. Um, that that was approved when they approved the um, the Beacon Lofts project, because mm -hmm. there there's just no way around the um, some existing buildings that are right over the creek. Mm. So so they accepted that as a way to you know kind of get through the property and then hook back into the more natural part of it. Um, and then your other question, we're, um, you know, we're, we're working with a site civil engineer on, on all those engineering questions. He, he's already developed his conceptual plan for that, but I, I didn't present that here. Um, we're, we're pretty well away from the creek, and he has you know, stormwater practices that work the same way we did with the uh, Beacon Loft project, so everything's treated before it would even be able to enter the creek. Um, we're, we're behind the flood lines, you know, so, so we, we, we have been looking at that stuff as well. So you said it would be treated before? So. Yeah, there, I mean, I can't get into the okay. exact methodology, but basically it gets filtered. And, mm -hmm. and then Natural I it filtration, gets, I think right. you're saying, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. and, and that, that's worked well over on the other property, so I, I believe it's a similar idea. Mm -hmm. and, and the water issues around this area aren't necessarily from the creek, they're from the prison. So the prison has a, a pond that they released from. So during the storm where one of those units got flooded um, during the September storm, we, we think that's due to a release that the prison made on their mm -hmm. pond. Yeah, and I'm just generally yeah. worried about the creek and yeah, but it, again, like, this is more than 100 feet away from the creek, so it's not too concerning, but mm -hmm. I do want to just make sure that um, water is flowing in a as natural a way as possible. The the parking spaces, um, in particular, that's a, that's a lot of pavement, and so I'd like to know where all that water goes to. Yeah, and, and that, that that's one thing um, which will come up in the next presentation. But but we, we we think it's a little bit too much parking. I mean that that complies with the code. What we might want to talk to the planning board is uh, land banking some of that. You know that which is. <coughs> showing that you have it but not building it right away mm -hmm. <clears throat> until it's needed and, and you know that's something the building inspector determines but and and the other thing is you know with the parking that far away from that, that's the furthest away from yeah. the creek and you know so there's time to make that filtration work are those three i think ren is touched. oh sorry I, I shared that concern, Aria, about the parking spaces and also as it relates to getting out of the development there, um, that left-hand turn for the current residents and how traffic flows there can be a little, um, can be a little hairy. George, yeah, man. yeah we'll, so, we'll look at that. And we'll, Ren, just so you're aware, the, the light that this entire development are private roads, but where it intersects with Fishkill Avenue, we're going to be redoing Fishkill Avenue starting next spring, and we will be upgrading the light there and making it an actuated light so, you know, you're not driving in at 1 o'clock in the morning and waiting 30 or 60 seconds for a light to change. Um, so we're doing that as part of the city's project. The other thing going on near here is eventually the, we hope the county will take on the rail trail project on the old rail line. Um, so any greenway trails we hope would connect up to the old railroad. Thanks for that reminder. Can you um, talk about the pump house, Aria? 
Sorry, I, I didn't hear what you said. Can you talk a little bit about the pump house there? Yeah, that that's an existing um, pumping, sewer pumping facility, and that that works with the um, Beacon Lofts project, and and I believe it also works for the uh, residential, you know, those brick houses between here and uh, 52. And that's a private uh, facility. It's not run or operated by the city. And this new development would not hook into that at all? Oh, I, I, yeah, I think it would. I think it would have to. Uh, I have had residents concerned about uh, smell there. Okay. Yeah, we. I mean, we can look into the engineering of that along with the, the rest of that review. Thank you. Can uh, someone uh, provide just a little more context about what I see that the private it is private over there. If anyone can drive in, I'm just curious about how the setup of this private development is. Like, is there a? It's not condos. Like, how how is it private versus we control the land? I'm I'm just kind of trying to right size what what impact we can have on that area of land the roads are owned by the um, landowners they're not owned by the city so once you cross once you go off fishkill avenue it becomes private roadways so we don't and we often get questions about plowing there and filling potholes um, but that's not publicly it's not public infrastructure so they own all the all the infrastructure. The people that own hip lofts, for instance, own the water sewer road infrastructure there, um, as opposed to if it was a public street, in which case we would own it. And um, I think Mill Street they have an easement over, and it's owned by the owner of the front parcel. Yeah. So an easement isn't doesn't give us the responsibility for maintenance, but it allows us to get in there if we need to. So sometimes like a developer would try to dedicate these roads to the city, in which case for the private developer, we'd be taking on the, um, you know, the long-term cost of maintaining the roadway. That's, that's not being applied for as far as I know. No. Um, general question and follow-up to that. Are there any um, guidelines or restrictions that the city currently has around um, maintenance of private roads? Obviously it's not our responsibility and it wouldn't be done by us, um, but it, in certain instances, it does seem like a health and safety concern. I'm wondering what oversight we have potentially. I'm yes. gonna ask Nick. Right, I was gonna say, so in most cases we don't, I believe with Mill Street, there was a concern from the fire department in terms of being able to provide safe and reliable access and and the developer and and uh, hip lofts did eventually work something out but generally we don't have any control over private streets it's up to them to maintain it and the individuals who are benefited from it to enforce it the only time we would get involved is if it as you pointed out um, impacts our ability to provide uh, um, appropriate and safe emergency access But generally, we're not uh, enforcing what tell someone to repair a pothole or to repave a road, a private road. Thank you. That was helpful. <clears throat> Aria, the, uh, there's those three kind of squiggly paramecium shaped things mm. along the. Uh, That's they, a planning term, right? Yeah, paramecium <laughs> shaped. Uh, are they just footpaths or is that associated with stormwater management? Uh, I, I believe that those are mixed. Th those are part of the landscape design, mm -hmm. and, and I'm not sure if he's also tying in stormwater to those particular areas. But um, it, it, it's yeah, it's just an additional part of the landscape design. Mm -hmm. It looks like they're catching rain gardens because if you if you cross it against the uh, topography, it mm -hmm. looks like those are where the water flow is. Yeah. So it looks like it's some kind of uh, rain catching garden. That's what I I'd love to learn more about that. If there's anything you could email us, just about the, the proposals for the landscaping and the. Okay. Yeah. yeah. One thing that you should be aware of is this um, entire property is in the um, hundred-year floodplain, 
And if Ari can point out, there's uh, a line along through the bottom third of that property that's the flood way, which means you can't build there. It's where a high, it's actually in the creek during high water events. And there's not much differentiation in height between that floodway line and the building. So flood mitigation is gonna be a big factor. They'll have to have an engineering report to figure out how they can deal with that to make sure that this building doesn't flood. Now it's commercial on the first floor. So it has a different standard than the residential, um, but that will be an issue. And that um, under the code, you have to deduct the acreage for the, from the flood way from your error calculations for the number of housing units you can put on the property. And I think they've taken care of that. It, it looks like they have, but the evidence isn't shown the actual area of the floodway and how it's been deducted to come up with the unit count that they're asking for. So um, the next version of this will have to have that information because that's something that has to be considered as part of the concept plan. Uh, the other thing I would mention is in the building plans, um, you've all right you've put two second floor plan or two first floor plans on they're identical oh. rather than this the second floor plan which is smaller in configuration so it misrepresents the building um yeah and and, and you can see that in that in the 3d model that the yes. um that's the second floor with the apartments are not taking up all the same space as the first floor And I, I would suggest that you might think about giving more breathing room to that Greenway Trail. Um, I'm not sure why the building has to be right up against it, um, but that's that's to be determined as you go along. And that's probably more of a site plan discussion yeah. than a concept plan discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I'm not so sure. That's the footprint of the building, and it seems to me that's concept plan. The actual landscaping along the Greenway Trail or something like that would be part of the site plan or this, you know, what that brick wall looks like. But the location of the building on the site in relation to the Greenway Trail, I would say, is something that the, the concept plan could, could address. Yeah, um, correct me if, again, this is something I shouldn't be addressing here, but it does concern me that the Greenway Trail is fully in the flood zone. Um, and I'm curious, um, I, I don't know the history of the placement of the trail um, and would like to know if this route has already been set or um, has approval from our Greenway Trail Committee. Yeah, actually that, that portion of the Greenway Trail that you see there uh, was approved, it was built and um, it's maintained by the owner. I mean, it, it, it is in, in the um, floodplain, but I think there was a specific Thing that was agreed to that they would you know if, if it ever got washed away it would get rebuilt right in that position but they've, they've never had a problem with that so far and the greenway trail always opts to have the trail as close to the creek as possible mm -hmm. even if they realize that ever so often there's going to be damage and it, it's not uncommon i did trail development for years up in ulster county and a lot of our trails were in the floodway because there's no other use so oftentimes you can utilize flood um, planes for parkland and passive uses and trails where you wouldn't want to put like a community center or something. And the cost of the maintenance of the trail goes to the owner or? Correct. Yeah, I think that was the agreement. Yeah. Great. What's the total height of the construction? I believe it's about 28 feet. I think it was, I think it was a full, I can't read it on this screen, but when I blew it up, I think it's the full height that's allowed in the district. It's, it's loft apartments, so they, they have very high um, ceiling heights. Yeah, so it looks like three sets of windows. It's the, the second floor has got two sets of windows. Right. Yeah. So in, inside the apartments, there's two floors. Kind of like the beacon lofts. Yeah, I mean, not not two full like floors. Like a, they're like a mezzanine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Is is the effect designed to be continuous with the existing beacon lofts that yeah. the residents will feel like it's one, it's one uh, development, even though there's the, the trail in between. Yeah, it's, and and also that I mean, th th there's that idea, and then also just th th those kind of building designs 
are kind of reflective of those old um, industrial buildings along the creek. But yeah, vi visually, it'll sort of tie in. Yeah. Last question for me, Ari. Um, can you talk about the studio common space and why it is on both floors and? Oh, uh, yeah, the, the, I, I, something happened with that drawing. I didn't get the, the uh, second floor on there correctly. So, so you're, you're just seeing the first floor right now. The, 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 the second floor is like a bar of space with the apartments on it. So I'll, I'll, I'll get that on the other. So the studio common space is for the commercial yeah. artists. Yeah, uh, yeah that, that's, that's just for the commercial. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, you might be about to talk about this, but are your parking requirements, 96 spaces seems like a lot for 28 apartments, but I assume that's connected to all the commercial space on the ground yeah. floor? Yeah, that, that, that's if we follow, you know, the, the zoning code for all the space that's required. But, um, you know, that, that's something that we would hope to talk to the planning board about. There is a shared parking um, provision in the code in which if you assume that so many of those apartments will have studio space downstairs, you can reduce uh, that parking count by that. And then there's also a land bank uh, provision in the code in which you can designate spaces but not build them and then review it for six months. And if they're not necessary, the applicant doesn't have to build them. And they can be reverted to green space or, contain, or retained as green space. And the site plan sheet, page one, details the number of parking spaces showing 35 for the residential and then 60 spaces for the artist studio. Mm -hmm. And then on the bottom right is the zoning compliance chart where it shows the height of the building at 40 feet. Is and the cons the Go ahead, Nick. I was just gonna say, the zoning chart demonstrates that the proposed project is zoning compliant. Is the, um, is the concept with the, the commercial gallery uh, studio space on the, the first floor that it would be open to the public at least at times that it's, or is it more meant to be for working professionals using that and it's not necessarily inviting it's not a, a retail or commercial space or open galleries at times or it could be yeah i mean that, that was the idea to, of having that central uh studio spaces you know that, that there's some flexibility there and, and someone who's working in there could put on some kind of a show or you know exhibit of their work so it could occasionally attract more cars to the area to visit that exhibit than those who use it on a more consistent basis or who live there uh possibly but i, I mean the, the the way that those things work is that, you know they still kind of like dribble in there mm -hmm. and, unless it's some big opening for one night and there is overflow parking probably on the other side of the greenway trail there's there's a parking lot right where that zoning table is mm -hmm. um so again between the two buildings there's a lot of the two large parcels there's a lot of parking on that site and i'm not so sure that it ever gets completely used up um, but there's a building under construction there and so we don't know exactly how it'll be when it's built out yeah the only thing i'd add is uh, this uh as a concept plan the concept looks about right um you know my only reaction is boy I'd rather have fewer parking spaces but if that's what the requirement is that's a what the requirement is. I hope they can land bake it and eliminate some of that. But otherwise it looks in the ballpark. I know there might be some other, we got some more questions, but it looks in the ballpark. Is there any rooftop um, uses thought about? Um, well, on, on the, the, the part that's only one story, we're, we're gonna have a, a garden for the tenants out there. Um, and, and, and also the ones that are directly adjacent to that have a little private deck. Um, on, on the upper roof, we, we were going to look at some kind of either green space or solar panels. Yeah, that's what I was going to suggest. Mm -hmm. I keep trying to bring up solar panels and we still haven't seen any built. Rooftops are the great, great place for uh, solar panels. Mm -hmm. Maybe and we should require them. <laughs> well, if you want to change the code, we might be able to do that. I don't know. Um, but the code just encourages them at this point. And we have gotten made progress on green, green cover on the on the tops of roofs, and buildings, yeah. Um, but not uh, solar panels yet. We've got promises for four sixteen, but not commitments. Four sixteen Main Street. 
Um, I'll also echo what, what John was talking about. I don't know enough to know how close the trail should or shouldn't be to the building, but I would hope as part of the Fishkill Creek development that we encourage passive other uses there. And I don't want people to get to what seems like a large area right at the end of the creek and then look towards the trail as it turns west and think like, oh, that's the end of the trail. That's just if you happen to park up there. Hmm. So make sure that they know that it continues on and feel invited to, to go on. So whatever the owner can do to make sure that that's known for anyone who happens to use the trail, I think would be something I would hope for. Mm -hmm. All right, there's some orientation signs down by that circle at the far right corner, I believe. So, and so, look at those. and so the next step would be either to request the applicant to come back and provide you with additional information in response to the questions that you have, if you feel that's necessary at this stage, or you could formally refer this at your next council meeting to the planning board for their review of the concept plan and to give you comments on it as well. Um, so I, Nick, I had one more substantial question um, that maybe uh, actually for you, um, I understand that 10% uh, below market rate is currently our, our regulation, but I would be um, uh, perhaps separately interested in seeing that raised to 20. Um, I don't know what exactly the process is for um, doing that. Um, but wanted to share that. Yep. So the process to raise to do that would be to amend your zoning ordinance, workshop workshop it. Have, if the council's in agreement, we would then draft the local law, and then you'd hold a public hearing and refer that to the zoning as well. Refer that to the planning board. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, is there any other interest on council for making that amendment? I'd be interested in pursuing that. What's the amendment again? Um, changing the required percentage of below market rate units from 10% to 20%. We're, we're really off I topic can, here. I can't hear. Can, mm -hmm. like, can we, we've we got like a couple hours um, agenda, so maybe we can put that on in a future thing, sure. but like. So I, I can't hear what's going on online. I, I so believe this is a condition for the prop for this property. No, that we it's do unrelated well. to this property. Well, it's related in that it's, um, impacts the percentage of affordable residential units in this. It, it's a different topic, though. Well, I think we're going to discuss. We already asked to have that added to the agenda. Oh. After we can, we can add that to a future agenda. Yeah. Right, but it doesn't pertain to this site plan, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Nope. We'll get there. So I would feel comfortable passing this along to the planning board at this point. I don't know if anyone else would ask the applicant to come back here. Nick, what's the process? Does the council need to do an amendment to do a, a resolution sending this to the planning board? Correct, yes. The council would need to do a resolution sending this to the planning board. The council would also need to discuss who would be the lead agency. This is subject to the State Environmental Quality Review Act, CECRA. As the city council has a role in approving the concept, it's what's considered a lead agency. The planning board is, I'm sorry, it's an involved agency. Planning board is also an involved agency. So when there are two involved agencies, one of them needs to, do, to be, uh, make a determination to be the lead agency. I will tell you that past practice has been the planning board has been the lead agency because they have the um, experience in dealing with site plans and landscaping and stormwater drainage. Um, and the city council has provided comments and areas of concern for the planning board to look at, but typically, and I can say typically in every case, the planning the um, planning board has been the lead agency. So you would need to um, have that discussion as well. So I, I'd be okay with where George is heading as well as uh, having the planning board be the lead agency. Um, so just one point, one one question. So um, so when we're looking at these site plans and we're signing off on a concept plan, you know, I like where the parking is. I like where the building is. I like the building's dimensions and the landscaping. What of those things, if, if we if we do the sign, if we sign off on the concept plan, what can can anything that I'm signing off on change after I've signed off on it? So we've addressed that in past resolutions. I can get you the exact language, but to provide that, right? There's going to be some changes, but I forget the exact language, if it was material or not. 
And there's also language in the code that I'll send to you that addresses that because, for example, the right, they can't flip the orientation of the building. That would Sorry, be what was that, Nick? The, the, like if they change the orientation of the building, uh -huh. they would have to come back. Okay. But I'll send the council to this specific language. I don't know if the microphone's more muffled tonight or I have a bird in my ear, but I can't hear anybody on Zoom. <laughs> Some of Nick's um, audio is cutting oh, out. Oh, okay. Yeah. So do, do we agree to pass it along at this point to the planning board? I'm happy to let the planning board be the lead on this. Yeah, I think we've provided some comments, right? So I'm, I'm fine. So we, we can prepare a resolution for the July 5th meeting. Uh, that's both a workshop and a voting meeting. So you can take a look at it and discuss anything that's left over in workshop. And then if you choose to, you can vote on it on the 5th or you could do it on the 19th. Um, but we'll work with uh, Keenan Bean to get something drafted. Okay. Great. And then we have the self-storage parking requirements. Mm -hmm. Right. So let me start off with an introduction on this one. I, I apologize for my audio. Hopefully it's... Uh... It's better. So section 223-26, paragraph F of your city zoning code talks about off-street parking requirements. And so there's on-street parking, obviously, and then there's off-street. And off-street parking is, is defined by the various uses, whether it's multifamily, whether it's a single family dwelling unit, um, a nursery school. Specifically, tonight we're discussing parking requirements for self-storage facility. Um, the owners at Hip Lofts have come in with a request that the City Council consider making an amendment to its zoning code with respect to off-street parking to modify downwards the number of required parking spaces required for self-storage facilities. Presently, self-storage facilities are fit within the category of wholesale and storage, which requires one space per 1,000 square feet of um, storage area. So 30,000 square foot would require 30 spaces. They're suggesting, and their traffic engineer is here to speak about it, that based upon analysis of other municipal codes, as well as their experience at the existing self-storage facility, that that use should be modified and a new category of off-street parking for self-storage facilities be adopted by the city council at one space per 10,000 square feet, plus one space for employees. And they're going to provide you with that um, that information. It's also, though not a project before you, you should be mindful of the applicant has uh, potentially considered the expanding the existing self-storage facility that is existing at the north of the property located uh, near the recycling center, if you will, in that portion of the property. So what you're discussing today would affect the existing self-storage facility, the number of spaces it currently provides under the code, as well as any future development. And so the request for you would be to introduce a local law that would be referred to the county and to the city planning boards for, for their report and recommendation and that you then hold a public hearing to create a new um, category of self-storage parking. And that's what is before you tonight. Yeah. Arie? Okay, uh, thanks, Nick. You said everything I was gonna say, so I'm gonna turn it over to our traffic engineer. <laughs> It, uh, yeah, but basically the, the idea is that the existing requirement in the code is, is a little bit onerous. Um, it, it requires a lot of spaces for what we've tracked at, at, you know, at the Beacon Storage Facility and others in the neighborhood and just general um, standards. It, it, it seems like we're, we're asking too, too much um, in terms of parking, but uh, Rich DeAndre, the traffic engineer can help you with that. Uh, good evening, Rich D'Andrea from Collier's Engineering and Design. Uh, just, uh, I'm a prof professional traffic engineer licensed in the state of the New York, so uh, transportation is kind of my specialty, so you'll get some some information from me that I think Nick summarized very well on the, on the parking end of things. For this. So, uh, we prepared a letter report that was submitted to your council, um, and I'm just going to run through, you know, the generic conclusions of that that report for your information. So, 
obviously the code, Nick, as Nick mentioned, is, is one space per thousand square feet um, as it currently stands today. So as I go through this, I, I am showing a potential 75,000 square foot uh, self-storage facility just for comparison purposes. Um, there's no specific proposal for that at the moment, but that's just the, you know, just a round number that we've seen 50 to 100,000 square feet is pretty typical for an indoor self-storage climate controlled facility. Um, kind of like what is already there today at, at the Beacon uh, Lofts location, obviously in a much smaller uh, size. Um, so as I go through, the first thing that we did was we looked at other uh, municipal codes. Um, actually, the Beacon's code, Beacon's code is fairly um, typical of other codes in the area, but there have been a lot of locations that have made an adjustment to their code specifically to provide for self-storage facilities. Um, so in Westchester, we looked at three different locations, City of Yonkers, City of White Plains, and the town of Greenberg. Um, in each of those locations, when you take a look at, and we also looked at the city of Albany as well, sorry. Um, and when you, each of those locations, when you apply their code to a 75,000 square foot facility, you're somewhere between seven and 15 spaces for a 75,000 square foot facility. So you can see how it's significantly different from what your code currently requires for that size facility. Uh, typically, you know, Self-storage facilities are, are much less parking, they have to require less, much less parking than um, what you, your code currently requires. The next thing that we looked at was industry standard data. So the Institute of Transportation Engineers, they provide a um, publication called the uh, Parking Generation Manual. Uh, they're currently at the fifth edition that was released in 2019. The data that they provide is based on studies of similar type facilities all around the country. Um, and this, for specifically for self-storage or what they classify as mini warehouse, um, they have had studied 10 different facilities, but the, the average parking demand rate from, based on ITE is 0.1 spaces per thousand square feet. So significantly less. Um, and again, for a 75,000 square foot facility, just eight parking spaces are required. Then. Lastly, to get a handle on you know what's really happening at the existing Beacon Lofts, and also we looked at uh, there's a life storage facility over on Merritt Boulevard in the village of Fisk Fiskill off of Route 9. We did some uh, observations uh, for Beacon Lofts. We were actually provided with um, the entry data from that location for the period from January 1 through April 20th, uh, and we did a an analysis of that data to come up with an idea of what is the actual parking demand at that location. Uh, based on that analysis, uh, and it's summarized in the letter that we submitted, the data indicated that that 25,000 square foot facility has a peak parking demand of, of three vehicles, um, which equates to about 0.12 spaces per thousand square feet. And then we did a similar so sort of similar analysis for life storage, where in that location, we actually sent uh, one of our representatives out to that facility to do observations during the day um, on Tuesday, September 14th and, and of last year and on a Saturday, you know, September 18th. Um, and then similarly, we just identified what's the peak parking demand throughout the day. At that location, we identified six vehicles. That's like a th approximately a th 60,000 square foot facility uh, equating to 0.1 spaces per thousand square feet. So again, if we apply that to our theoretical 75,000 square foot facility, we're at eight to nine parking spaces. So kind of, kind of in line with what the other codes are that I presented are, and uh, with uh, the ITE data as well. So based on all of that, we kind of came up with a conclusion on on what we would recommend. Um, and you know, we there's some variability in this a little bit, but our thought is that one space per thousand square feet plus one space per employee, because it's typical to have one employee on site at, when the facility is open at any time, um, would be a reasonable number of parking spaces for a self-storage facility. Uh, and, and again, that, that applied to the potential 75,000 square feet, that, that requirement would give you nine spaces for that facility. So um, that's generally the information that was in our, our letter, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have.
So um, right now there's a 25,000 square foot facility at the Beacon Lofts? Correct. And is there, is this, I don't know if it necessarily matters, but is there plans to try to expand that and that's why we're looking at this? I think now? that's the, the potential idea. Um, but okay. there's no, I don't, I don't have a There's specific a proposal, proposal that I'm presenting to you tonight. Okay. But the 25,000 square feet already exists? Correct. So yeah. the parking's already built too. So why is this coming up out of curiosity? I think there is, there is an idea to potentially expand that facility. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't have a specific plan to present to you, uh -huh. but I think there's an idea to present that facility, but, or expand that facility, but, the parking requirement is so onerous that it would make it infeasible at the moment. Mm -hmm. does, does the current um, self storage have the uh, the correct parking relative to our existing code? Um, so I'm not exactly. Sh I wasn't involved in how that the approvals of that. I don't know if you are. You can talk to that. Yeah, so basically, um, again, going back to that original approval of the Beacon Lofts project, that also included an expansion of the um, of that 25,000 foot existing facility. Um, so that all that parking was designed in for, you know, for the, for the existing and the, and the addition. So it, that, that's all set up. It, it hasn't all been constructed yet. And the addition hasn't been constructed yet. So um, we, we kind of want to see where this parking is going and then figure out how that's going to all fit together again. Um, I appreciate how thorough and detailed you were, and it was interesting to see the parking requirements from all the other municipalities related to what we are talking about and just in general. So mm -hmm. I enjoyed <laughs> all, all the details there. You're welcome. I guess I'm wondering, you know, if the, if we have this information, um, sorry, I forgot the name of the, the professional association that's recommending point Institute, one. Institute of Transportation Engineers. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm looking at the, the comparative chart of Yonkers White Plains and um, on the whole, they seem to be somewhere between 5,000 and 7,500 square feet, um, but they're not requiring the, um, the space for the employees generally. So I think what happens then is um, if we do 10,000 square feet plus the number of employees, I don't know when, when something scales, when a storage scales from 25,000 to 75,000 square feet, how many more people do you need? You still have one person at the front desk handing a key out, right? It's pretty typical, yeah. Yeah, so I think, so we probably wanna go in the, in the direction of Sorry, I just I just tricked my own brain now. <laughs> Doing the math in my head. Let me do the math in my head and figure that out. But I just want to make sure that we're getting it right. You know, I don't want to like if we're focusing on the one employee and doing ten thousand square feet, um, the parking requirement gets smaller smaller per square foot as you get as the building gets bigger. If you have a requirement that's between five thousand and seventy five hundred, but doesn't include the employee, am I doing this right? Then yeah. as the building gets bigger, the parking remains the same, right? Well, no, so think. There, there's two things you, you, we, you could do. You could, you could work in a minimum number of spaces, number one, right? And then obviously as, as the parking gets, as the building gets bigger, if you go to 100,000 square feet, we're going to need 10 spaces. If we go to 150,000, I don't think you ever go to that, but under 50,000 square feet, you need 15 spaces plus the one for the employee. So you're, you're always going to be increasing the number of parking spaces you need. And the idea is that the size of the facility, the number of units that you have in the facility is what's driving the number of parking spaces that you need. And so this is something that the planning board, when they review it, would look at based upon their experience and the planning board or council may just want to ask the city's traffic consultant who's a member of the IT Institute of Traffic Engineers to weigh in on this and offer uh, its opinion as to what the right amount is. I'm sure John might have some comments on that as well. But the, the next step would be, if you're interested in pursuing this, would be to have us draft the local law, bring it back to you, and then 
it can be referred to the planning board and the county for a report and recommendation. Yep, so, you know, all, all I'd add is that this is clearly going in the right direction. This looks like one of the more egregious examples of, you know, 60s cars are everywhere, you know, zoning counts for parking. Um, I'm fine heading in this direction. I'm okay with 10,000 uh, and, you know, one, one for each employee. Uh, if it were a slightly different calculation, I'm fine with that one too. Uh, and I would encourage John uh, Clark to bring us any other silly examples and, you know, um, on parking as well. Because I, I, I know we're heading in the other direction in the next 20, you know, a couple of generations in terms of, you know, the, the parking we're going to be needing. I don't want to complicate this application for the applicants, but, um, you know, I recommended three or four or five years ago that um, you go through the entire parking table and lower the standards because they tend to over park everywhere. Yeah. And this is just one example. So let, um, let's split it in two, like, you know, you know, let's deal with this one, but I think we should also put that in our to-do list to look at ours as well. Okay. But we're not actually changing, we're adding another category, are we not? Were you changing yeah. it by taking it out of the wholesale category and making its own definition? Right, so we're, correct. But, but we still have a wholesale storage Category. Well, wholesale, you wouldn't have storage. Correct. Oh, I see. Okay. I, I would recommend that you leave in storage in there. So there's a differentiation between warehouse storage and self storage. Right. Yeah. Um, there's no reason to take it out of that other line because it's different than a self storage unit. So if it was me, I would say um, leave in storage where it is, even add warehouses to that because that's sort of typical of what a storage unit is a warehouse. And um, and then add a self storage line, which is what, for instance, Albany did, which of the examples seemed to me the most up to date one in terms of um, it's more recent. And uh, I looked at the other standards for other things and it made a lot more sense than, uh, than any of the other certainly examples that I looked at, including beacons. So as a model, I think uh, uh, the, uh, the Albany one looked like the best model for me, but um, and the, and the but Albany one had bicycle one parking the too. The strongest argument was they went and looked at two facilities that are exactly white, like what they're proposing and did counts. That seems to me better than taking the word of some other community and how they came up with that number, you don't really know. So John, we can work with you then on that exact language and bring a proposed local law to the council for a future workshop. Okay. So that's the consensus of the council, which is, I think, was what I'm hearing. Okay. All right. We have some appointments here tonight. Yep. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks. Hey. Thank you, John. Do you want, uh, so the first uh, we have. Uh, the fifth item on the agenda is an appointment of Isabella Nosserino to the position of police assistant. Yes, yeah, so just some context here. In the last collective bargaining agreement that we negotiated with our PBA, the union, um, we were given the flexibility to hire additional police assistants. And most of you would know this as a civilian dispatch. It's basically a, a non-sworn person who's not an officer who answers calls and then helps to deploy our resources. So we have one full-time person now who works on the day shift. The idea was to hire a second one to work on the night shift. Um, and we put this in the budget. It's taken us a little while to ident identify the right person, but we think Isabella is the right person. She's done this job um, in the town of Fishkill or East Fishkill. I think it's East Fishkill. And she um, she also took the police test, and she is reachable on the police list, but she's too young to be an officer. Yeah. So this is a great way to see if she likes our department and our department likes her, and then when she eventually turns 21, which isn't too far away, um, then she could be considered as a police candidate as well. Uh, so she, we're proposing to hire her and our current dispatcher 
Uh, she'll work with the current dispatcher for a number of weeks and then go on to her own shift. And she's from Beacon, so that's helpful because when people call in and say, oh, I'm over at the you know, family dollar, she knows where all of that stuff is. Or I'm over where Ray's Pizza used to be, you know. <laughs> that's that's uh, how people describe a lot of things. You know, the landmark that was there 15 years ago. Or, yeah. Um, I, I think it's great that this happened to work out, that, that especially as she's expressed an interest in the you know, police career generally and, and here in Beacon, and to be able to offer her something that I assume is a yeah, well-paid And she's studying salary. criminal justice at Dutchess Community College. So um, she's smart. She was National Honor Society in high school at Beacon High. Um, I, I, we're pretty excited about this one. That's great. So we would bring that uh, resolution on the 5th. Okay. Um, and then we have an, I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, I would love to know more about her competency in other areas of work outside of the police. Um, my understanding of this dispatch role is that while maybe initially 911 calls go to the county dispatcher, if you call the police department, this is who you're speaking to is that is that framework correct i'm sorry can you say that again paloma um my understanding of how this role works with other emergency services is that this is who you get on the phone if you call the police department directly um, but if you call 911 the dispatch system is actually through the county and you may be redirected to the Beacon Police Department. Is that correct? If it's correct that if you call our local number, the 8314111 number, this goes directly to the desk, the dispatch here. Um, my understanding is a 911 call would first go to the 911 call center that the county operates, and then it would flip over to the appropriate agency. So then it would be routed to the dispatch here. Um, and so there is a different dispatcher line for, say, our ambulance services, our fire services, or does this position um, dispatch all of all of our services? So if you call 911, which is what most people do, it goes to the county dispatch, and then it goes to like if it's an EMS call, they'll put it out to the agencies that are queued up for that area. Usually they have a primary, a secondary, tertiary, um, and, and mutual aid. Um, if we, we are unique in that we have a local number so that if you just want to call and ask a question, like, you know, we, we get all kinds of calls about a, a, a dog that's running down Main Street, or, you know, I have a question about X, and it's not really something you'd call 911. They also get those. But generally, um, nine, most of the calls um, are routed through 911. Like, mostly accidents. We, we do a lot of accident response. Great. I, I just, the reason that I'm asking all of these questions is that I want to make sure that her experience, which seems to be um, almost entirely under the police emergency response, is appropriate for the role. This, we, we are going to be discussing uh, certain things in um, executive session, and I would ask that we leave this topic for now and talk about that in executive session. Okay. Uh, and and I, I, I would say she, she comes highly recommended. This is an entry level position. Um, we have an appointment of Zachary Ross to the position of motor equipment operator. We have tried to fill this several times. Um, you had approved someone who after you prove them, they um, got a counter offer from their job. So Zachary is, was somebody that we identified as the next person we wanted to hire when we had an opening. He's a construction worker with uh, Dutchess County, and we would propose to hire him now that um, our, ta our first candidate um, got a more lucrative offer. <laughs> My only question is, is, is CDL license up to date? Yes. Fantastic. Yeah. 
and and very experienced in every with all all of the equipment that they use here yeah we wouldn't we don't hire meos that don't have a cdl Um, and then we have the appointment of Elise LaRocco to the Tree Advisory Committee. Uh, this is a mayoral appointment with the consent of the council. Um, and you have her resume and application in your um, packet. And we understand that the current chair of the Tree Committee uh, was pretty excited about this addition. Yeah, she looks like she has some good relevant experience and interest yeah. in her resume that she included, which I appreciate, along with her stepping up to volunteer in this capacity. Um, so that will require a resolution. Um, and then the next. Sorry, sorry, one question on that. I recall from our community, um, sorry, our committee's meeting that there is supposed to be a member that is both on the tree advisory committee and on the conservation advisory committee. And I noticed in her application, she seemed potentially interested in both. And I'm wondering if this is an opportunity to fill that position, which I believe doesn't currently, isn't currently yeah. filled. Yeah, I, I don't know that I'd propose that right away. I'm pretty happy just to fill a slot on the tree committee. And, and maybe we can see how that develops. I wouldn't want to scare her away by saying, oh, we want you to serve on two committees. Um, but it's certainly something we can consider and Ben is listening and can coordinate on that. That sounds like good reasoning. Yeah, don't scare off volunteers. <laughs> um, the next item is a follow-up on the video conferencing and Nick is gonna lead the discussion on this. Yeah, Chris, at, at the public hearing on the local law that would allow members to take advantage until July of 24, uh, the amendment to the open meetings law that the governor signed into law about two months ago, there was a public comment about whether or not there should be a limitation on the number of times that a council member could take advantage of the ability to participate remotely under that provision, which allows the council member to um, attend remotely in cases of um, significant hardship, I believe was the standard that was used, extraordinary circumstances, that is defined in the policy. So I believe one or two council members wanted to have the discussion about that comment. And before you have that discussion, we looked at another uh, municipality that had a provision that stated that um, such significant or unexpected factor may include vacation period or periods when a member is working away from her home location, not exceeding four weeks in a calendar year, or when a member is unable to attend at a meeting location as a result of unexpected travel difficulties. So in that particular municipality, they put a limitation on the extraordinary circumstances only with respect to uh, vacation periods, not in general, because someone could have a sickness or an illness or, or um, uh, um, caregiving issue that might extend to longer. The other provision would be to put a limitation in your policy, but then leave it up to the discretion of the mayor, or in the case of the mayor, the deputy mayor, to determine whether to grant the exception beyond X number of meetings, if you wish to entertain that discussion. So we'd looked into the issue, and those were the two options that we um, have explored, should you want to explore adding to your policy. So um, I would be, I personally don't think that there should be a limit on how many times a council member attends remotely. However, I do think it would be fine if there was a limit for vacations. Um, I don't see that being a problem, but I mean, each of us have lives outside of this and like extenuating circumstances do happen, things come up. And um, I think whatever we can do to make this as accessible as possible. And there are some circumstances where like even tonight, if somebody was sick, but like, and unable to show up, however, they were still able to be present in this way. I don't see a reason to limit the capacity or limit the amount of times that they do show up uh, virtually. Yeah. I'm. I assume, Nick, this isn't part of current, like even with our current thing where you have to notify 72 hours notice, like someone could in theory do that as often as they wanted. There's nothing legally that limits them from doing that. 
That is correct. Under the current open meetings law, if you gave 72 hours notice, one could do it as many times. Correct. Yeah. I mean, I, I would like to think best practice is that if someone is taking on this role, they plan to be in person as much as possible. Um, and I'm also, I'm, I'm hesitant to legislate it. I'm wondering if there's something we could put that at least suggests a strong preference, but otherwise I, I agree we get into, you know, into trying to control, you know, ideally if someone knows that they have to travel on Monday nights and that's part of their current employment that they maybe wouldn't step forward, but also if they're able to bring other things to the community and the community, I would hope the community at least knows that as they're voting on them, um, but that's, you know, not required. So, um, and if they're the best person that that might be okay, given the other options. So I, I would, I would just, I'm not sure. I Go ahead. I have Ren trying to. Oh, yeah. Hi, I would be curious to know what our HR director thinks about this. Um, and it, you know, it's interesting because we're elected. So um, I, I don't know, are there any precedents, Nick, for how disciplinary action works for city council members that would be sort of related to this sort of thing? There isn't. It would be have to be set forth in your policy as to whether someone could do that. The only action would be they would be not able to participate, right? If you put a limit of four, and someone went for five, but you didn't allow it, then they wouldn't be able to participate under this exception. As They could, however, participate upon giving 72 hours notice. So there's no discipline per se. However, you could also, because this is a policy, you can amend this at any point in time. So you can leave it as is. And then if it becomes an issue that council members wish to address down the road, you have that ability upon a majority vote to change your policy. Thank you. That sounds like a good solution. And this law expires when again? July, July 2024. I mean, I if this was if this law were going to be around for longer, I would be worried about leaving this open for abuse. Um, you know, someone who decided that they could get away with uh, calling into meetings on Monday nights. Um, the people I know on, on council, I don't think are going to abuse this. And I, I would agree with Nick that we can always come back and we can um, we can always change it if there's there's some uh, something something not working out. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad that we're having this discussion because I, I think it's it, I think it was worth having. Yeah, no, I appreciate the members. It was actually something I was thinking about, too. And then I made the internal decision to not bring it out loud like members of our public did, which I appreciate that it probably wasn't worth putting in our policy. But I think it is worth naming. And hopefully we don't have to revisit it in, in the future. But that's not something we necessarily can plan for right now. Um, Nick, um, is there a, I mean, is it possible that this law could be extended past July 2024 by Albany? It's possible, but I actually think there's a lot of communities who are not in favor of this law because it's too restrictive that they would, there's efforts being made to have Albany enact a far more broader law. So mm -hmm. I would expect that in the next year or so, you're going to see different legislation. But if we just, let's just say, like, let's say we're, we pass this law, Albany creates a new law, we would have to uh, adopt, we would have to, well, we would have it, to it, adopt a new resolution related to the new law, right? So at that point, we could decide whether we wanted to put in some kind of, that would be like a checkpoint for us to check on, you know, abusing the, the privilege, right? I'm just pointing up our local law just to see how we've drafted it. So, if all right, Albany could adopt a law. This just makes reference to 103-8. This well, city's local law doesn't say it expires in July 2024. We say that again. Nick, your audio is cutting out again. No. So the current version of the local law does not say that it expires in July of 2024. It ties it to the state law. So if the state law were amended then this local law would not have to be brought back to the council. The way to bring it back to the council would be to say that this law expires in July of 2024, and then it would require reauthorization by the city council.
to be, I'll be, um, I mean, I, I will always want to get every law right, but I also don't want to spend a half hour over thinking a law that's going to be not widely used. Um, so I, you know, I, I defer to my colleagues. I'm not too. And I, and I think as you've seen, our, our, our office has kept you up to date with these changes. And likewise, if this law were further expanded in July of 2024, we would let the council know, and that would be an opportunity to have a discussion. Mm -hmm. I think that would be fine. And then we would also have a history of the law being enacted and what kind of practice it's actually affected us. So I'd be happy to uh, adopt this. Yeah. Likewise. Um, I do just want to try and quickly make sure we um, answer all of the questions that we received during uh, the public hearing. Um, and I, I personally would vote for um, adding the limit on vacation only abstinence Ab absences or remote participation, um, but also don't feel too strongly about it because of the limits on, on our local law. Um, there was a question that clarified um, whether or not the public noted, the public location had to be within the city of Beacon um, and it does not, is that correct? That is correct, it does not have to be. <clears throat> um, it just has to be hypothetically <laughs> open to the public. Um, not under the 103A provision. Under this provision we're talking about, the public- Oh, yes, sorry. Yep, no, I know yes. it's a, it changes. <laughs> but this provision um, does not require the public the right to attend. Um, and then the other question that was raised is um, if there is any desire to um, change how we um, allow non-city council members to attend remotely or not. Um, I again don't have strong feelings about this one, but did want to bring it up since it was part of the public hearing. And maybe the answer is none of us have strong feelings about it, so we'll leave it as is. <laughs> well, I think cool. we have enough people, enough of consensus among the council to pass this. Uh, along and adopt at our city council meeting of next week. Yes. Does everyone agree with that? Um, yes. Okay. Uh, to 20, 2023 to 2027 capital draft capital program. Wait, can I just, for just a, one quick thing? Um, I, I couldn't quite understand what Paloma was saying um, did we just skip over a point that they were trying to make? Paloma, were you talking about the other comment that's come in about what about those who attend our meetings who aren't city council members and whether or not they're in person? I see you nodding on my screen. So yes, it, so it sounded like you were saying that you wanted to acknowledge the point, but you yourself did not have a strong opinion about whether or not we should try to include that, particularly in this current version of our law. I can see you nodding. <laughs> so, um, uh, I, yeah, just to pick up on that, that I too remember that being brought up as, you know, we have, um, you know, our, our attorney being one example of that, have been in person and hasn't been in person for a while. I, um, again, can express a desire for it. It's not something for this particular law I think I want to try to include, but I could see it being something that maybe we bring up later and if we get more comments based on this conversation about why people feel about that and the impact they feel it's having on the city we can bring it up again um, but i will say i personally am not feeling it's enough of an issue right now or it's hampering our ability to do our work as a city to need to adjust the current draft of the law that we're considering but i'm willing should to have a requirement that the city attorney get a new microphone before the next <laughs> meeting <laughs> there you go <laughs> And, and not have his lights keep turning off. <laughs> yes, so noted. It, it is fun watching you wave those back on, though, Nick. I have to, see, have to say, trying to add some entertainment. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, so to say, um, unless anyone else has something to add, including Lee and Ren, I don't know if you've had a chance or want to chime in, but I'm fine to do as you suggest, George, and bring this to vote at our next voting meeting next week. That's 
All right, Chris, the capital program. Um, okay, so to recap, we um, submitted a draft capital program for 2023 to 2027 on May 31st. You held a public hearing on that on June 21st and left the public hearing open to be reconvened on at the next um, voting meeting, which is July 5th. Um, since you, since we last discussed this, we have made two changes. Um, one, we have deleted recreation items that were contingent upon a grant that we were told we were not getting. So the $450,000 for Veterans Place that was in 2023, and the $50,000, the $80,000 for Bridge Street um, that was in for 2023 have been removed. No, and we didn't we, get that money? No. Oh. We didn't get that money. And I'm glad to give an update maybe in capital in the executive session about that because it's, um, yeah, we, we never even got to formal application. Uh, so um, I'm sorry, is somebody trying to speak? I did have a quick question if you considered leaving that in, even though it's, um, it wasn't funded. No, I didn't. Um, I, those were projects that I would not have chosen for 2023. I, um, at some point, maybe I would do them, but based on all of the work that we have coming up in the next two years, the only reason that I put them in was because we had we had somebody ready to hand us half a million dollars, and I don't often turn down half a million dollars. Now that we're not getting them, um, I, I would say we go back to a normal prioritization, and and that's not anything that I would prioritize right now, based on particularly the firehouse project that's that's going to take a lot of our bandwidth and a lot of our available um, fund balance and debt. Understood. Thanks, Chris. And the other change that we did put in um, was we put in an item, a yearly item for $400,000 for milling and paving. Um, this, for some reason, had never been added to capital budgets or to the operating budget. So it was in our financial statements. We were getting revenues from the uh, Consolidated Highway Program, CHIPS program, and every year we were doing approximately $400,000 in uh, milling and paving of our streets, which we're going to be doing in late July and August this year. Um, so we decided that that needed to be on some budget to show you know, that, that we are spending resources, even though they're completely reimbursed. Um, so those are the two changes. Um, a couple of the council had asked questions, and I wanted to follow up on a couple items. I did talk to the city engineer about the Spring Valley Street project. Some of that project was implemented and some was not. So there, were, there was a plan set that was developed back in May of 2008. Uh, my understanding is the city was lining up to do what would have been about a $2.8 million rehab that would have done all of the sewer, the sidewalks, and the surfacing of the road. Now that, think about that. That's almost $3 million in 2008 for um, a quarter mile of road. Um, and when we mill, like we could mill half the city for that. Um, so they didn't do the work because the city ended up being under a consent order for wastewater that ended up uh, putting us on track to spend millions of dollars to update our sewer treatment plant. Now, the, the good thing is the sewer treatment plant is much better than it was, um, but some of these projects, and I'm guessing Fishkill Avenue, Teller Avenue, was also delayed because of that. Um, so some of the sewer work has been done. The road was repaved under the CHIPS program back in 2015 or 16, so we're not supposed to even pull up the road for at least 10 years after we invest CHIPS funds. Um, so I've asked the engineer and the superintendent of streets to go look and see if there are other aspects of the project that weren't implemented that should be implemented. So we'll come back as, as we can develop and ripen the project. 
Um, some of the other smaller items that um, you raised, Dan, we're also willing to vet, but I don't have enough information right now to know that I have anywhere near an accurate cost. Um, yeah, I appreciate you getting back to me about those other ideas. I had proposed putting uh, some amenities for Green Street Park back in, uh, taking a look at that uh, that potential new park down by the creek, and one other thing I can't remember. Oh, Howland and DePoister uh, sidewalks. Um, so I appreciate you getting me back to me about those, but it, it raised a question for me about um, what the council's involvement is. Um, and so it seems like anything that I propose to add to the capital plan, we can't really do it because we have a scoping process before we put it in the capital plan. So I guess I was supposed to come to you months ago with my ideas for the capital plan so we could scope them to add them in, or I just want to get it right next year. I don't want to miss an opportunity to yeah, I mean, know, if, if you for my ward. If you want to um, propose things, we can vet that, but it takes some time to yeah. get some cost estimates. I also know vetting can be a lot of work. <laughs> it, it is a lot of work. And, and the other thing to keep in mind is we can do some of the smaller items through our budget. So um, I'll be discussing this at upcoming meetings, but we're proposing to use some money that I have in the highway budget to fix some of the sidewalks on Main Street where there are mismatched sidewalks that mm -hmm. need to be grinded down. And rather than, you know, typically we would put that on the adjoining landowner, and we've talked to the attorneys about putting out a letter to say, hey, you have this issue with your sidewalk, but in the interest of making all of the sidewalks on um, Main Street look similar and not somebody patched with asphalt, somebody patched with concrete, yeah. somebody ground it down, that, that we will take that on as the city, mm -hmm. you know, and that's a smaller project. Or like when you had brought up equipment at Green Street, if we have some available budget, we might be able to fill some of those. Mm -hmm. Then on the larger projects like um, sidewalks on DePeister and Howland, I, I would wait until we do some kind of sidewalk plan because I think you have a lot of sidewalks that exist today that are sorely in need of repair before we go building mm -hmm. new sidewalks. Well, I would, I would. Um, and you saw that with South Avenue that we'll, we have out to bid right now mm -hmm. uh, to do the segment between Wolcott and um, West Center Street. Yeah. I, I think we can look at it all through the lens of safety, like what are the most unsafe situations. But I think what, I, what I'm really getting at here is um, I've been kind of looking forward to the multi-year capital plan because I saw it as a, an opportunity for me. You know, I don't, I, I, I'm, I do focus on Ward 4. I consider myself just a representative of Ward 4 and I feel I'm the only voice for Ward 4 at the table. So I had been looking forward to the capital program, the multi-year capital plan as an opportunity for me to uh, get some Ward 4 projects into the capital plan. And I feel like I kind of got caught in like a chicken and an egg thing where like I, I looked forward to this for two and a half years and now I kind of missed the boat. <laughs> so I just, Well, I mean, uh, like for the DePeister Halland, how much do the sidewalks cost? I, I don't even have an idea. I don't know how much right away I'd have to acquire. Like on Fishkill Avenue, Teller Avenue, we had to acquire over 30 right of ways just to build sidewalks. Mm -hmm. So do we have available width? Do we have, um, if we were to do that, what infrastructure is below it? How do we decide which side of the street it's on? Mm -hmm. if, if we put them on that street, um, there may be other more critical areas that go begging for a sidewalk. And, and again, I would think about two things in a long-term policy for sidewalks. One is um, having some kind of mechanism where we fund them every year to try to, um, to, to keep investing in sidewalks. There is, to me, they're as important as roadways. We, we would never think about not doing roads for a couple of years. The well, second, and the second thing that I would do is because our resources are finite, both in terms of our capacity to do projects and because of our finances, you need to prioritize where those go. So safe routes to school, to me, would be a no-brainer. You know, let's make sure the areas that from um, dense housing to schools have safe sidewalks. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would also, you know, I, I also would um, prioritize some of your main corridors that, that go to other areas that people generally walk to, like mm -hmm. parks. Um, 
And, and again, I would also look at the condition of your sidewalks. There, there are some areas where you have sidewalks, but they're really not, they're not ADA compliant. Um, they're, they're irregular, they're mismatched, there's gaps in them. Um, you know, if you were in a, in a assistive de device for walking, you wouldn't be able to even navigate them. And you see that people going down the road with um, the motorized uh, wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, we, as we do roads over, we are doing some ADA improvements to all of the ramps and, and stuff. Um, in terms of the other projects you brought about Green Street, we can look for what available funding we have. If it's a small item, we can put it in the operating budget. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, if you if the council all um, again to move this beyond just ward four, if you have ideas, um, you can send them in to me, and as we um, have an opportunity, I can discuss them with the department heads, mm -hmm. understand what the issues are, and then we can have a discussion amongst the council about how we how we prioritize that. Mm -hmm. Over, we wouldn't have gotten these in this year or next year anyway. We really have a lot on our plate. Yeah. I mean, we have $25 million in projects going out to bid or construction in the next 18 months. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, we're, you know, again, I love doing projects and bring it on, um, but it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, no, I, I did propose them for the out years. I, I guess if, um, if we weren't, if we can't propose things to add to the capital plan because they require scoping, what feedback were we supposed to be giving? Well, you you can give me that you want us to scope that out for okay. the next plan, and I'll I'll do my best on it. I mean, sometimes like um, some of them are easier than others, like the park improvements at Green Street. Mm -hmm. That's probably a lot easier than. Mm -hmm. All new sidewalks for miles yeah. on how it's a, at least a couple of miles, mm -hmm. um, you know. So again, that that could be a two, three, four million dollar job. The the three point seven miles on Teller Avenue, Fishkill Avenue, which includes the roadway, but it's sidewalks on both sides. It's going to um, end up being almost eight, nine million dollars. Mm -hmm. um, but we we can do our best to try to get some. I mean, and and. I also do want to say we did include what I thought was the most important item that this council asked for, which was a community center. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so it's not criticism. I'm just no, trying no, to no. Get I'm, the I'm just saying. I'm so trying to represent yeah. The board. yeah. So even on that, I had a, you know, we're doing a recreation study to try to ascertain what that looks like. But I had to kind of throw a dart at the board and say, I, I guess it's about five million, but it, it depends like on what you, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate you bringing this up, Dan. And I think, Chris, as we, just like we have, like for this calendar year, we sort of came up with our priorities. If with things like projects, if there's a way, which we sort of kind of did organically with the community center, that I think part of maybe why you put it on there is that all of us seem to be talking about it. Right. So I'm wondering if there's a way to that as the city council, we can collate and pool our projects and we can do some prioritization. So when you're not having to deal with, all the wards things, but if there's some collective thing there that might also help you figure out how to make best use of your I mean, time. what we can try to do maybe in between the operating budget this later this year and the capital budget next spring is have a scoping process. But I also want to keep expectations realistic. Like most of this capital budget is driven by the people that run our departments because mm -hmm. they know what they need. And um, you know, again, I think even what we've proposed is quite aspirational. It's over $35 million. And, and it, again, for water and sewer, it's only three years because we couldn't even get out five years with those. So, um, you know, again, I think we're going to have to, we, we can do a process and then maybe what we do is one or two projects that we really vet and scope out because that takes a lot of time. So, um, so we do have the public hearing open, which will be continued on July 5th. At that time, you can accept additional public comment and then close the hearing. Um, and you could vote on it on the 5th, or you can also delay that to the 19th. Um, but it does need to be adopted 
according to your charter um, by July 31st. So. Okay, you wanna move on? Sure. Um, tenth item is the council rules of procedure regarding written comments. Nick and Chris will help with this. Nick, do you want to take this one? I just talked a lot. <laughs> I do, Chris. Thank you. So the question before the council for discussion was what to do when the council receives uh, written comments and how do those get either read at the meeting or attached to the minutes. So my experience in other municipalities and also what has been done in the past with the council is that the purpose of the written comments is for the council members to receive and be aware of a constituent's or residence or someone else's concern of a matter of interest that they believe is of interest to the council. So when public comments verbally, they're here, you're receiving those. When they're written, they're emailed to you or if they're mailed, if anyone still does that, Ben or the city clerk would then transmit those to you. Those are official records. Those are maintained and kept. The um, minute don't would not include a transcription of a of a of a read of a um, I'm sorry a written submitted copy, and nor are they read typically at council meetings. Um, you have already received those, so there wouldn't be a need to then read those in public. Uh, public hearings, if written comments are submitted, those are kept and maintained with the clerk and again distributed to the board members. Um, the minutes could reflect, you know, receipt of a written comment from resident X, but it wouldn't detail those those comments. The minutes and uh, rather the receipt of those comments are for the benefit of the council members, which when they're emailed to you, you receive those. And again, I've not seen policies where someone writes something. I would also have a concern that when you're reading something, are you then um, potentially slandering someone because you don't know what the, the accuracy of those statements, yet you would be publishing a statement? Obviously, that's not, that's not the concern all the time, but that can be a concern with certain comments that are received. Those are my general thoughts on the topic. But that's a topic for discussion. And the other thing that I discussed with Nick is, you know, we've had some recent comments that um, some in the council found offensive that the person wanted read, and and I don't want to be an arbiter arbiter of what's hate speech, what's acceptable, what's long enough, what's not long enough. Um, you know, these these are the areas where we end up getting bogged down so that we don't get real work done. Um, I'm, I, I have no interest in judging people's comments and saying which are proper and which are not. And it just is easier to say written comments are not going to be read into the record. We said they may be. We didn't say they shall be um, and or appended. Now, when people come to our meetings, their comments are not in the minutes. So you're giving preferential treatment to people who submitted in writing. And then there's the question of, well, what's a three minute comment in writing? Um, or what's an appropriate comment? I think you give wide latitude for people to comment. They have, um, a, at each voting meeting, they have a session in the beginning, a session at the end, they can do it in person or they can do it via Zoom. Um, that's that's pretty good. And if the intent, again, is to communicate with the council. They've done that through writing. When somebody asks this to be distributed to the council, if they haven't already distributed it to you, we do distribute it. So you do get the comments. And that, that written comments um, to the council would be included into the package, sort of historic. So someone could reference that um, if they want to look up a meeting. And it was noted that there was a letter from X. They could see that letter. No, it's just they would they could foil the correspondence from the clerk, right, Nick? Correct. That would be the procedure. Yes. So, but they could is what. I'm no, saying. yeah, it's available. Yeah, it's it available. is available. Yes. Correspondence has to be um, retained by the clerk. So. And I, I don't think there's any action necessary on this because you've left yourself a lot of room. But I, I just wanted, we've had some recent people that wanted to append stuff to our minutes. Um, and it was members of the council themselves who objected to one of them. And I, again, I don't, 
I don't want to get in a battle about whose, whose speech is proper and whose isn't. Um, and the last item. I'm sorry, two, two thoughts. Um, <clears throat> one, I think that if this is the direction we're going, then we should clarify that more clearly in um, our guidelines. Um, I know that you already covered that it says may, um, and, and maybe that really does cover us. Um, I just want to make sure we have clear consensus among all council members that this is our policy now, because from a communication standpoint, we've said several different things to the public over the course of the year. Um, and I want to be 100% clear when we get these questions and that we have the consent of the council to, for this to be our policy, to, to never read um, written comments um, and to not include them um, in the packet, which are all past practices that we have had. I mean, I don't, I don't think Paloma anything forbids a council member from saying, I mean, one night I, I read a prepared statement from our county legislator, Yvette, um, and I don't know, I just, I just did it. <laughs> so I think if there's ever a public comment that you want to read in a meeting, I think you can, you may, I think is the exact verb. Except the, the only words of caution is that, and it's words of caution that you may then potentially be accused of reading some, but not all. You yes. do have certain legislative discretion, so it's just something we need to be mindful of. You know, if you want to read comments, we're going to have to read all the comments, even the ones we find really offensive. Well, this is actually my question because Dan just contradicted that policy. So, are we saying no reading comments or? What are we saying I, here? I am, I am proposing that we do not read comments, that if somebody wants to make a comment, that they would have to do so either in person or through Zoom, absent they have a disability where they cannot verbally communicate and they need to have accommodation for that. I, I will always make an exception for disability. So if somebody's had a stroke, for instance, and can't verbalize their comment, that, that I would make an exception. Well, I think as we're talking about this, um, we have to consider what the the intent of the public comment is. Is it for us, the council, to know what's going on? Because then if it's just in writing, then right. the goal has been achieved. Um, yeah, that, that's what we were trying to say. Or like, is the goal mission for the public to be aware of something that's happening? Like who is the council, who is the comment speaking to, I think is the real question when we're looking at this and I think the audience down. by by tradition and and by design has been this body mm -hmm. I agree right? I mean we've had people I want to remind you we've had people that wanted us to like publish a 20 or 30 slide deck presentation on their ideas about various things this is not the forum for that I mean if you want to get any work done this is not the forum for that but you could make it the forum for that if you um, don't you want to be here at 11 o'clock every night? I mean, couldn't someone who um, had a comment they wanted to, to make, but they weren't able to make it themselves, give that written comment to someone to read during the public comment period, either at the beginning or toward the end of the meeting? If, if they do so in person or via Zoom, yeah. But I mean, if why can't they make the public comment? I mean, we have we have people that um, we've made it really easy for people to comment. They can be in their living room on Zoom, and you know, I think these hybrid meetings have actually made our public comment a lot more accessible because you don't you know, like if you have a child care issue or you have a transportation issue most people can get online to do that. And I also think they have an opportunity to give it to someone else that might be here in person. Sure, Just if they want a friend to come and deliver it. I, I, there's, we've never stopped that. Yeah. People, I recall people reading other things that people have written. I think the point I'm trying to make is, is simply um, that while there, there are some things that we have practiced in the past um, and that we are changing and some things that we have practiced in the past that we are not changing. Um, and I just wanna be very 
clear because I think it's really important for the community to understand how they can and can't make comment. And the one sort of concrete edit that I'm hearing is that written public comment is no different from just sending us an email. It is not, yes. um, and that we should say that so that people understand that. There are no additional restrictions on it. These guidelines are for in-person, or sorry, not in-person, but live public comment. Um, and other communications with us are something else. That seems fair. I had a misconception around that originally as well. And I think I might've been the one that brought up a comment in email, like how, how do we actually address this, so. No, I, th I think it's evolved a little bit. Like I think we've, we didn't do it and we really didn't do that in the last council that I recall. We started to do it a little bit because um, people were, oh, well, I can't make it. Well, we'll append it to the minutes. And then it just, I, I think seeing it play out, I, again, I, I, don't, I don't think we want to be in the role of judging whose speech is correct and what's not defamatory. And, and again, the the main goal is to communicate ideas to you so that you can incorporate them into your decision making, which you do. I mean, there we have discussions every week of stuff that came through emails. So clearly the communication is working. I would just say though that we do have guidelines for live public comment where we are policing people's speech. Um, and that in the comment it's enforced by um, whoever our presiding officer is. And so what my, just to clarify, like my understanding of these rules originally was that um, those written comments would be subject to all of the same rules as live public comment. Um, but my question was who enforces that? Because in live public comment, um, the acting, the presiding officer enforces that. Right, but the, we're not treating them the same because if someone makes a public comment, not in public hearing, it's not going to end up in the minutes. It's certainly not going to end up verbatim in the minutes. Right. Whereas the suggestion is that someone would write something and it would verbatim appear in the minutes. That just, I don't think that's the same treatment at all. I think we got into the right spot, which is you have multiple opportunities to speak your piece in, you know, whether in person or remote. And there we are. And just let's make it clear, as you suggested earlier, that uh, that submitting written comments won't end up in minutes. Yeah, I no, I think we're saying the same thing. Yeah. Um, I I just want to point out that we do, in fact, uh, have restrict speech for public comment. Yep. Okay. Last item. Uh, the last item um, before we go into executive session is a proposed extension of an agreement with Royal Carding Surface Company for waste collection and disposal. Um, the city, as part of your taxes, does provide pickup, weekly pickup of garbage and recycling. Uh, we do through uh, that through a contract with Royal that costs the city approximately one point. 1.05 million a year, so just over a million dollars a year. Um, they pick up from approximately 4,500 households, and um, we pay for the disposal. Right now, the disposal of recycling also costs us money. Um, so I haven't included, that's additional on top of that. Um, so for this pickup, we did a bid back in 2019. Um, we um, chose car. Uh, Royal, which is really the only company in the area that can provide this scope of services. Um, and we use them for 2020, 2021, and 2022. So we've done one-year extensions. Um, that contract was to come due at the end of this year. And we, about now, or even a few months ago, we should have started a bid process for a new company. I've been working with Royal to see if they would extend the price in their original contract for one year, as long as we don't change anything in any of the services. So we would have the same cost. We would be able to budget that for next year. Um, 
And I talked to Nick about it. Um, under, under state law, we have to bid every five years. Um, so we have, in theory, two extra years we could do it with council approval, even though the original contract was envisioned as a three year. Now the, the rationale for me not going to bid the reason you go to bidding is so you get a better price. If we know that there's really, there's only one other company that does a mini bid, um, which is waste management, and they're really not firmly planted here. And based on some of the competitive advantages that Royal has, I don't think they would ever even bid. So if we rebid this, it's just an opportunity for Royal to raise the cost, because um, their costs have gone up of labor, disposal, fuel, um, and even the toters, the plastic and the toters. Um, so they were willing to extend the price another year for the certainty that we would stick with them and not put them through an onerous bid process. Um, so that's what I'm bringing forward. Um, Molly had asked a question about whether the Main Street litter baskets is in that um, contract, and it is. It's a very small component. Um, that it, it, it's almost less than 1% of the value of the contract. The main, if you think about what the value of the contract is, it's picking up 9,000 toters a week, half recycling, half um, garbage, and then it also pays for the disposal of garbage. We have 56 litter baskets along Main Street, and my second week here, I was so frustrated with the condition of them that I called the head of Royal and we've begun a conversation. So over the last year, you'll see every one of those has been um, taken back into their shop, power washed, the graffiti taken off, the stickers taken off, and the apertures at the, the hole at the top have been widened so that there's less collection of um, debris. I still don't think we have the right design of those, so over a period of years, I want to move away from the ones with the tops and the side open gates and move to a simple waste basket that just has a, a no, no top on it and, and a simple um, plastic insert that you can pull out, and, and then we would avoid this. So um, again, there's an investment in those old cans that were chosen years ago. We tried to make them better, and over time, I will try to get them replaced out. The biggest complaints I ever got about the the, the trash cans on Main Street was that uh, they weren't emptied after Saturday when there's a lot of tourists in yes. town. So it like fills up, overflows, is laying on the ground, and it does, no one's going to get to it until Monday. So, so we, we did talk to Royal about that, um, and we explored options for like, hey, can we switch Tuesday pickup for Saturday? And their costs for picking up on Saturday are dramatically higher than during the week because they're paying people to come in on a weekend. Um, we could do it, but there would be an additional cost. So that we can do separately from this, but we would negotiate a side letter agreement. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we've done is um, I do have, since we were getting complaints about like garbage piling up, we do have somebody from DPW going down Main Street on Mondays to, with a, a broom cleaning up around there, making sure that the gates can close because um, one of the design issues is those inserts don't fully fit. They, they were designed for a different insert that no longer is used that was half recycling, half garbage. And that was a spectacular failure because it all went in the garbage because it was so bad, it's so contaminated. But now we have these replacement containers in there and the stuff gets down in the side and then the doors don't close um, and it just backs up. So we're gonna try to manage it in the, in the shorter term and then in the medium or longer term, move towards a better design. Um, I appreciate you giving that thorough, Chris. As, as you know, and as mentioned, that's one of the things that does get commented on from time yes. to time from the public. Um, I will say, as whenever it comes up in the priorities to look at um, garbage cans, I'm, I'm interested in whether or not it's worthwhile to put some recycling options on the street. I appreciate we can't stop people throwing whatever in there, so maybe it's not worthwhile, but I would like to know if that's something, um, particularly with our compost-minded community, if there's opportunities to separate out garbage from other things. Um, we, we can definitely have that discussion. The short answer, the, the prior council brought that up, and in talking to our department heads and talking to Royal, 
it's much harder to control public garbage receptacles on a main street than it is at home. People t don't wash out stuff. People are putting inappropriate things in that contaminate everything else. And from an environmental standpoint, it's better to just throw the stuff away than to have these contaminated loads that have food and soda and beer and spilt all over them that end up in the garbage anyway. The other, the other environmental benefit of not doing the, the is, is you don't have a second set of trucks running up and down the street. Um, so again, if there's a point at which we can figure out, I would like to just try to do the garbage well, and we're not doing the garbage well. Um, so once we get that down, maybe we can figure out if there's certain spots that make sense to deploy recycling and do them as a pilot or a test. But, but again, I, I think our households do a really good job of sorting, cleaning, um, recycling, and we know that we have really good recycling compliance. But it wasn't so with people who are out having food and drink on Main Street who just, oops, you know, there it goes. I don't want to jump too deep into this right now because we can have this discussion later, but maybe there's a way that we can collaborate with local businesses to like have points in businesses where people can just recycle. Um, yeah. Rather than have it directly on Main Street where it gets. Yeah, I'm open to alternatives, but I, for this, for purposes of this contract, I, I just want to get the pickup correct. I, we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about how they should close the gates. So I, I just had a, a quick question about um, extending versus like renewing the contract entirely. If you wanted to just renew the contract, you would have to put it out to bid. That's and correct. And that's why, okay. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, for your, if it, if it makes sense with the operating budget, if you're able to put a number to what it would be like to add Saturday service, I don't know if that would be part of our operating budget. I'd be curious to know what that number I, I don't even know I, if I would understand what that number actually means, but I think just to... Yeah, I'll get, I'll get a number for that. Great, thank you. Okay, and that's our last item on the public agenda, and we do have um, an executive session. Nick, do we need a motion to go into executive session? We need a motion to go into executive session for the purposes of personnel. And to uh, and then have a second. Would someone what, like to make the what was the second? Yeah, we missed the second part of that, Nick. Oh, we just need a motion and a second. We don't always get a second and then a vote. Okay. So Sir. I motion to go into executive session and to conduct no further business after. Second. All in agreement. Aye. 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 Okay. And those.